Warning, the following podcast contains adult language, themes, and situations. Also, the film we're about to talk about is going to be spoiled thoroughly. Listener discretion is advised. Enjoy this show. Some might say consuming six full glasses of whiskey, a 12-pack of PBR, a bottle of wine, and a mint julep is a tad much for one man to drink over a roughly 12-hour period. But they forget that that man is a god and his name is Nicolas Cage. Today, we're looking at his only starring role to ever warrant the dreaded 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, Grand Isle. Okay, let's run. (laughs) I'm like a prickly pear. I... What do you say we cut the (laughs) chit-chat (laughs) a-hole? Porker, Porker, how did you burn? How'd it get burned? How'd it get burned? Hey, have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and being taken? Pissed blood! Welcome to One Cage at a Time, the show where we break down every single Nicolas Cage movie, one film at a time. Here are your hosts, Patrick, Vince, and Nigel. A young father and husband has been charged with murder on Grand Isle, and the only way he can prove his innocence is to recount a twisted and dark night of events involving a war vet played by a constantly with a drink in one hand and gun in the other, Nick Cage, and his sex-starved wife to a skeptical detective played by Frazier Crean himself, Kelsey Grammer. Ladies and gentlemen, here are your stars. Grand Isle stars Katie Strickland, Luke Benoit, Kelsey Grammer, and of course the legend and American national treasure and the greatest (laughs) living actor today, Academy Award winner Nicholas Kim Coppola, better known as Nicholas Cage. Yeah. Yeah! Patrick, hit us with some stats, won't you? Grand Isle was released on December 6th, 2019. This was the sixth movie that Nick Cage did in 2019 after A Score to Settle, Color Out of Space, Running with the Devil, Kill Chain, and Primal. Buying a T-Rex skull, a (coughs) nine-foot-tall burial tomb, a $150,000 Superman comic, and 15 residences, including a private island in the Bahamas, and two European castles means sometimes you have to choose quantity over quality. (laughs) (laughs) He also did... taste. Yeah. He also did six movies in 2018, and six movies in 2017, and five movies in 2016. (coughs) Jesus. Whew. He's the hardest working actor in Hollywood. He is. Seriously. He is. This, this movie had a budget of $5 million. It had no box office. Uh, mm-hmm. It went direct to, I don't know if it went direct to streaming or if it went direct to video. But when I looked it up on, uh, I think it was like box office mojo, it said that it had collected $2,221 in <laughs> Blu-ray and physical <laughs> media <laughs> sales. Like, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Wow. I think so we it's sold account for about like, yeah. a thousand copies or a hundred <laughs> copies. Am I doing my math right? If it's about 20 bucks a copy mm-hmm. and it made 2,000. So yeah, it sold about a hundred copies. <laughs> well, uh, we just bumped up an extra 12 yeah, bucks. Yeah, we just <laughs> buying it. So. We just bought oh, a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, physical, physical media is still a thing. <laughs> Even though it was kind of a waste of money because there's no commentary track, there's no behind the scenes, there's nothing yeah. that I wanted to out of a physical disc yeah. it was yeah. just I was movie and, about that yeah i just watched it on hulu so yeah could have just <laughs> it's watched also it on, on hulu. Cr- it's also on crackle which is a great um sign of quality if you've got a recent movie <laughs> on, on crackle <laughs> uh it was written by Ivor william jala i'm not sure if i said that right but and uh rich ronat um and was directed by stephen campanelli which uh, I didn't really look up what Stephen Stephen's credits so, were. Uh, I can't speak to all his credits, but he was Clint Eastwood's cameraman for one of his camera operators for like twenty years. Oh wow! Uh, wow. Yeah, he grew up being a huge fan of Clint Eastwood and ended up getting on his crew and working with him. And he left to do, I think it was Monumentum. I think it was the film was his first directorial debut, and then just he's kind of had some oddball movies here and there, but. Some of those movies have had some big name actors in it. Um, 
yeah, it was kind of surprising <laughs> to see that uh, he had spent so much time under Clint Eastwood. He left, which was probably good for him. He left in the middle of American Sniper. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw that movie, but it was a hot yeah. mess. But he did yeah. take one of the best parts of that movie from uh, and and brought it into this film, which was the um, the fake baby. I don't know if you guys got that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna bring that up when we got to it. <laughs> I saw I was that. Funny I was like, because oh, I, makes sense. I haven't seen American Sniper, but I got some definite like American Sniper fake baby vibes from that scene. Yeah. That's that's really hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I saw that part. And I was like, oh okay, yeah. He he must have been the guy that's like, hey, let's use this baby. <laughs> American Sniper. <laughs> it's the worst well, that kind of makes sense. Like it makes sense that he worked with Clint Eastwood for that long because like this movie was was shot pretty well. Yeah, this, it was. this I, movie I, was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we kind of mm-hmm. talked about it before when we were chit-chatting back and forth about it. But like, I mean, that's yeah. definitely the strongest part of this whole movie is yeah. um, Eric Moynier was the cinematographer. I'm not sure. I'm probably butchering all these names. But he did a hell of a job and he, it looks like he's worked on quite a bit of different stuff. So, you know, I guess it's not crazy to think that he knew what he was doing, but like, <laughs> yeah, it's funny that it was, you know, $5 million. It's like, you know, low budget movie, but with a decent production crew. So yeah. I guess that's what oh, you yeah. get when you send him. So most low budget movies are just like low budget, everything like, yeah, it's funny that $5 film million is a, is a low budget movie now. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, how much of that was Nick Cage's paycheck? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yeah. Well, I think it at least a million dollars. So there's there's twenty percent of your budget yeah, right there. Whatever the minimum SAG dues are or SAG. <laughs> oh yeah, pay. it's true because he's got a he's gonna have a minimum. <laughs> as we said, this movie has a zero percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. But um, if you actually look at the the actual ratings, it was three point seven nine, which is actually. Pretty decent, if you think about it. It's mm-hmm. 3.79 out of 10, so that's almost a 4 out of 10, which is what we gave Wicker Man last episode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Metacritic score was 29%, which is actually technically lower than what Rotten Tomatoes is 0% is. <laughs> and the audience right. score is 51%, which I... I kind of agree with the audience score, honestly. Yeah, it seems about the same. We should yeah. say, like, I don't, I don't know how Metacritic's rankings work. Rotten Tomatoes, all it is, it's an aggregate of what, how many percentage of reviewers gave the film a positive review, which is a 6 out of 10 by their own metric. Mm. So all a zero means is that, I don't know how many people reviewed this, probably like 10. 30. So 10. All, 10 re- <laughs> all 10 reviewers that reviewed it, none of them gave it a positive review. That's all the zero means. So saying that it's a you know a 30 or, or almost a four out of 10 it's that could still it's, it could be one in the same thing you could say that, yeah it's about a 40 percent you know it's like a yeah an f f grade i mean <laughs> but not know, a zero spoilers i think uh, our rating is probably going to be about that too yeah. so <laughs> technically we would give so, it a zero yeah, percent we would give it a zero it would be <laughs> yeah. a zero on rotten tomatoes yeah. so <laughs> Usually when you have a movie that's reviewed by hundreds of critics, it evens out a little bit better. Yeah. You have a little bit better <laughs> when ten. nobody bothers to review it. Uh, that's will skew the numbers a bit. Yeah. How about a Coppola quick facts? Uh, this is the first collaboration between Nick Cage and Kelsey Grammer, which is kind of crazy because Nick Cage has been, now he's been acting in five decades <laughs> worth of films. Uh, <laughs> Kelsey crazy. Grammer's career has been going since, you know, the early 80s, probably late 70s as well. So, yeah, it was pretty yeah. crazy to think. But yeah, at the same time, it's kind of like Kelsey Grammer's always been in this, like, kind of more highbrow stuff. And Nick Cage is kind of yeah. like, well, if there's a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably not a lot of overlap. <laughs> No. Yeah. The original screenplay was called Fancy Buddy and Mr. Walter, which <laughs> <laughs> I could sit here all day and come up with stupid names for movies, and I don't think I could ever come up with anything dumber than that. <laughs> no, that one takes the cake, man. That is <laughs> Fancy oh, Buddy and Mr. Walter. <laughs> the 1950s sitcom or something? <laughs> What wacky eye drinks will the three get up to tonight? (laughs) This is the lowest rated and lowest grossing movie ever led by Nick Cage, which is surprising because the movie's actually pretty decent. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's cool because it's nowhere to go but up from here. Exactly. Like, if this is (laughs) the worst Nicolas Cage movie, which I know for a fact it is not because I've seen way worse (laughs) Nicolas Cage movies. Um, yeah. Which leads me to my next quick fact. This is the first film with Nicolas Cage in a starring role to have a 0%, which is pretty crazy if you think about, I mean, he had done, what, 97 films or roughly, you know, roughly 90-something 
starring roles and had mm-hmm. never had a 0% in a starring role, but he does have a 0% in a supporting role, which is actually the movie that we're doing next, Deadfall, which <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. I didn't mean to do that at all. When I picked Grand Isle, I was like, well, that's a newer movie I know nothing about, so let's put it on the list. I, I feel like because of the choices on the first four movies, this show might feel like it's more like we're we're poking fun at Nick Cage. <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like this show is a celebration of Nick Cage. We just yeah. happened to pick yeah. four kind of dopey movies in a row <laughs> that are, I yeah. honestly think are all brilliant in their own ways. So <laughs> To head that off, I will say I really enjoyed Nick Cage in this movie. I love so Nick right Cage in this movie. Me too. I, I, I have loved I, Nick Cage right in gate, every movie be, <laughs> I've ever seen him in. I won't be ragging on him. <laughs> yeah, Even if he I shows up for two probably, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is probably one of my favorite uh, Nick Cage movies now. Just cuz his <laughs> he's just so over the top but it fits so well in this yeah, crazy so story good. that unfolds throughout the movie. <laughs> This movie actually won a couple of awards. Um, it won the Spotlight Award at the Lone Star Film Festival and received a special mention at the Noir Film Festival. So there's huh. that. Awards hmm. of some sort. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it almost feels like a movie that was made just for a film festival. Yeah. Like they were they were trying to go for those awards and, you know, was, yeah, I guess yeah, got really it, hard. but... Uh, we were talking about it too. I don't think it deserved it, but <laughs> <laughs> we were talking uh, uh, before we started recording about this kind of feeling like a, a student film, which yeah. this mm-hmm. was actually, um, uh, I'm going to butcher his name again, Ira William Jala. This is his first writing credit, um, which he's now, he's got a bunch of things in the works. So it kind of is a student film if you think about it. Yeah. Aside from yeah. that guy who worked with Clint Eastwood for 20 yeah. years and uh, Eric Moynier, the guy who was the cinematographer. I mean, you are never going to get cinematography that good in a, in a student film. But yeah, no story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes me wonder how much of the movie they cut out to shape what we ended up getting, which is and why it still I feels... really was so sad they didn't have the commentary track. Yeah. Mm hmm. Because it felt like there was well, so much more that was yeah. on the pages. I think the studio was probably like, "We're not putting any more money into this. You're not doing. You're not doing a commentary. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> this made two thousand um, dollars. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna cut that. Let's just. Uh, yeah, we'll put it out and try to get money back. <laughs> I wonder if it had, had a some sort of theatrical release. It had. It would have definitely had to have made more. So I wonder why the decision mm-hmm. was made to not. Maybe it was like a producer scenario, and they wanted to make a bomb so they could recoup their loss. That that actually might be it. Could, could be. I mean, it could yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> like the movie, the producers is not entirely a joke. That they do have insurance <laughs> on on how bad a movie yeah. bombs. <laughs> I mean, that's not um, unusual for Nick Cage lately. Uh, Seems like almost all of his movies are direct to home video in some way or another streaming Mm -hmm. or or Blu-ray or whatever. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I think almost all of the movies that he's done in those that big, you know, six movies, three years in a row and five movies before that, I think almost all of those were direct to streaming or direct to video. Yeah. Aside from like his, like mm-hmm. the, the Crudes and uh, Spider Man into the Spider Verse and all mm-hmm. that stuff, the big budget stuff. Yeah. Let's break this bitch down. Act one. Let's set some stuff up. So our story opens in 1988 with Fancy. <laughs> yeah, that's her. That's her actual name. It's Fancy. Uh, so she's it's being Francine. <laughs> something. Frank, uh, Franklin, yeah. I think I wrote it we'll down. But... It. Yeah, we'll break it down okay. here in a little bit because she, she'll tell it to him, Fancy. which makes it even better. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it starts out with her opening the door and being super creepy to these two Girl Scouts. Um, and at one point, she looks at this little white girl and she says, oh, you're the most adorable girl I ever did see. Uh, and just completely ignoring the uh, African-American kid, which... I was like, mm, okay, Southern accent, racist, kind of fits in. Uh, <laughs> and then it cuts to later that night, um, and you see somebody breaking into a house. You don't really know what's you know what's going on. Um, and my favorite part of this whole scene is it. You see this arm reach over the bed, open a drawer, 
there's a pistol in there <laughs> from the moment that that person gets out of bed all the whole the camera just tracks crotch level <laughs> all the way to the stairs until it finally pans down the stairs and you see somebody run across. So you have like the loudest burglar in the world <laughs> stealing running from this the house, house, right? Yeah. Just running through this house. Hardwood floor. It's an old southern house with so hardwood floor, everything, right? He starts stealing some stuff and then he hears a sound and panics. And then you learn he's also the dumbest burglar because he runs to a, lo- a clearly <laughs> locked door. How did he get in? That was my question. Was like, that's, that's my question too. Why it's didn't like, he go back out you, the way he came in? Yeah, like why didn't you go out the way you came in? You run to the front door that is locked. It's chain locked. It's like you could see it's bolted. Mm-hmm. And before he can get the door open, our hero, Mr. Nicholas Cage, <laughs> shows up with a huge <laughs> grin on his face and says, you picked a, a hell of a wrong house to, to rob or break in or whatever <laughs> his, his line is. The kid panics as he gets, as he feels the gun at the back of his head. The kid panics, runs into another room, jumps out a window. <laughs> Through a window. Jumps off the... Yeah, or through the window. Sorry, he, he, thank you. He jumps through the window. He jumps off the deck. He starts running. And as he's about to hop over this white picket fence, Nick Cage just blasts this guy. <laughs> just blasts him. And it causes that fence to break, obviously, you know. Huge plot point right here coming up. Mm-hmm. Just remember that fence. So after that, it cuts to Buddy. He's all he's all bloodied up. Uh, being interviewed by Kelsey Grammer. Um, I, I you know, had so many questions it, about this. Like, why? Why is yeah. this? Like, it looks like somebody just dripped a bunch of like fake blood onto him, <laughs> like right oh, before they started yeah. filming the scene. Like, nobody <laughs> yeah. wiped him off, or mm-hmm. no? It looks like they took a paintbrush and just started flicking it at him. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So he he gave him more washcloths. Yeah. So like you assume that he's uh, he's the guy that got shot, right? Even though he's beat up, you kind of sitting there like, what? Yeah. Spoiler (laughs) alert. You assume he's the guy that got shot, right? And my question, like like you guys said, is like, why why was he still bloody? You know, don't you think paramedics would have taken a look at him? They would have cleaned him up. He probably would be in some kind of jumpsuit suit because they would have booked him. But we don't have those things in the south. (laughs) Yeah. Then then you get it. (laughs) <laughs> then you get into uh, Kelsey Grammer. He's doing uh, his best foghorn, leghorn impression while uh, questioning Buddy and asking him, do you believe in God uh, or not? Uh, and he tells him he wants to hear his side of what happened. Yeah, yeah, it's in the South. You know? And then he wants to know, I want to hear your side of the story. But he says it like the most condescending way. I don't know. That's That was my impression of it. Like He doesn't really believe that this guy's going to have a good story to tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a he's uh, so, a uh, he's a terrible detective. <laughs> yeah, it was awful. it was awful. <laughs> he was an awful detective. He knows he's right, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the best detective. So, that, that's that's what makes so the best said, detective. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Buddy starts telling his story, and it cuts to uh, him talking to some random guy, trying to convince this guy to uh, buy into his. Uh, investments or in his investing scheme at some random podunk cafe it was just um, super big was, like what the I hell thought was, he was he trying conning to the sell? guy yeah i, I thought he was like or, a con yeah. artist that he was trying to get him to invest in some fake thing it was never it's never addressed again i don't think yeah right. they never say what it was um and then like <laughs> i thought it would maybe come back later but it never did you know like oh yeah. i have some dreams and mm-hmm. i got some things in the works he kind of says that to his wife but like never explains what it is you know, like, yeah. is it related to the business he already works at, which is also super vague? Like, <laughs> yeah. I think he I says get a, Charlie I he got a for call. A business. Yeah, Char- oh, like yeah. he said, like Charlie got a call and they want me to come fix a fence. Yeah, it was just like yeah, it was it was the most generic. Like, if you're trying to write like business stuff, he just has papers and he's like, look, <laughs> the numbers are going up and they keep going up. And when you got a good thing, you got a good thing and you got to get it on the ground floor of this thing. And like, that was the dialogue. <laughs> yeah, love, it really was. That guy didn't say a word. Yeah, he didn't all. say a word. Not a word. <laughs> Probably so they didn't have to pay him for saying anything. Yeah. <laughs> he's pitching this idea that makes no sense. I mean, it's just super vague. And I, I too thought the same thing. I thought he was trying to con him. I was like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. so this kid's just going to be a con artist. So, so my mind's I, thinking, okay, he's going to try to con Nick Cage. And, and at the time, it wasn't really clear that to me that uh, Fancy was Nick Cage's wife in the movie. But uh, so I thought it was going to be a whole con thing that goes south. Uh, 
So that, that sort of tracks actually, because they talk about like he robbed a liquor store at one point, yeah. and yeah, yeah. they bring that up too. Yeah. yeah. So it's like you just get all this weird information. It's not very good about building out this character, or setting him up, because he's just like, well, I don't really know anything about him. But he, he's talking to the guy. The guy has no interest in it at all. <laughs> Uh, never says anything like you guys said and you hear a baby start crying in the background and also somebody's like oh oh my wife's here okay hold on i'm gonna you know we'll talk about these investments later and turns around and uh he goes and sits down with his his wife and uh, their new <laughs> newborn baby that just conveniently happened to be at the cafe yeah. and i think right. it's the only she cafe says, in the whole town you know it, well, right. i mean it must you can, be you, you're not gonna set up two locations for shooting like <laughs> right. you can just do one five million dollar budget guys shoot That's everything true, in the yeah. same place we'll yeah. return to this cafe i even later. thought that i was like i was still on the train that he was trying to scam the guy so i'm like he mm-hmm. goes from scamming him to turning around and walking six feet over to sit with his <laughs> wife to talk about how he failed at scamming the guy who's <laughs> still sitting over at the table <laughs> she's like i watched weird. you fail i watched you, you don't have to tell me you failed. you're we real money. bad at this our mm-hmm. baby's coughing. So she like, which she's talking about think, how were they, they, were they in, which made me think like, uh-huh. are they, were they dining in the restaurant? And then he just went out and started talking to a guy in the parking lot and started. That's where this whole thing started or what? There's questions where those deleted There's a scenes lot of questions. would have really helped out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Direct his commentary. So he sits down with her and she's, you know, explaining how they need money because the baby's coughing. Um, she's offering to get a job at the cafe and, you know, he's a good old, uh, southern man so ain't no wife of mine working you belong in the house like a good wife kind of mentality um and he says you know we're gonna get this money uh, i just got a call and they specifically requested me to uh to go fix this fence or to do this work i, I don't think it's clear at the time it, it sets up you know that things are a little rocky and then he talks to her about oh you know i'd really like to take a trip with you just the two of us uh you know it's it's been a while since we've been intimate and she says the classic lady thing. Well, I just don't feel so sexy now that I had a baby. <laughs> All this could have, like this whole movie could have been avoided uh, <laughs> if the two couples, Fancy and Walter and Buddy, and I can't remember his wife's name, if they would have just like, you know, the couples took care of each other intimately. <laughs> Lisa. 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 Yeah. I wrote it down. I think it's mentioned whole, that one, one time. <laughs> this whole movie goes down this weird sexual rabbit hole, but if like Walter and Fancy had just taken care of each other and Lisa and Buddy had taken care of each other, mm-hmm. you could have avoided a lot of this. I, I mean, probably I would the say the thing. first like two thirds yeah. at least. The last act yeah. kind of uh, the yeah, last takes act's a weird, own weird story turn, but... within the story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One thing we should we should mention real quick is uh, we just revealed that it wasn't Buddy who fell through the fence uh, because he was specifically requested to come and fix this fence. So now mm-hmm. we know yeah. Buddy wasn't the person who was shot the night before. Uh, so after you know him and his wife talk and and she lets him down and tells him you know I just need more time even though it's been six months. You know, he takes his sexual frustration, frustration, heads off to fancy in Nick Cage's house, a.k.a. Walter. <laughs> that's that's Nick Cage's character's name. When he shows up, Walter gives him the greatest look up and down ever captured in, <laughs> in film. I love and that. Hits him with <laughs> so much, man. That was that made me laugh so hard. This like look where he like. He like looks him in the eye, then he looks him in the stomach, then he looks him at the feet, and then goes back to the stomach, then back up to the face. Uh, so good. And then so he can almost the hear the director team. giving the directions. I, f- I feel yeah. like that was another Nick Cage choice of like, how can I make this interesting? I got an idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you would how never would see that in any other movie. Down. No. It was, yeah, it's like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> And then he hits him with his character's signature <laughs> kind of <laughs> beef as a butthead style laugh, which uh, he does a lot throughout the film, which there's a moment that when, I, I, that when you guys get to talk about, that's like mint acting on, on his part. Uh, so the, the Mustang one? <laughs> the, yeah. So... Walter Walter tells Buddy uh, if he can get the fix if he can get the fence fixed before the storm hits he'll give him an extra two hundred fifty bucks. Uh, this is when Buddy tries to negotiate with him um, and up it to three hundred. Walter drops the price down to uh, two forty, which leads to Buddy somehow knowing that Walter was in the military. <laughs> I guess it's because he's good at negotiating. <laughs> I wasn't really clear on how that. 
I, I that's like, that's, that's one of my knowing. big uh, questions for the end is like, uh, what what gave away that yeah. he was in the military? Aside yeah. from apparently mm-hmm. he's good at negotiation, uh, it should carries out himself this. a certain way. No, I, I didn't see any tattoos. There was no, there was no like, tattoos, no yeah. haircut, mm-hmm. nothing. No, I mean he's wearing just like normal clothes. Like that, I had to stop and rewind that part and rewatch it to, because I was like, I must have missed something. Yeah. Nope. No, nope. he's just like, yeah. oh, oh, you know what they it's call because he read the script. <laughs> he read the script, so he knew that he was <laughs> oh, touche. He had the people in the curry. <laughs> but uh yeah so for you know all of a sudden that comes up he's like oh yeah uh he knows that he's in the military and and uh walter says he was in the marines back in nam um and but he says we well, should I was point in the out Navy. that this takes place in 1988 so it's yeah, not yeah, like it opened, present yeah, day so nicholas cage is not like a 70 year old man <laughs> right. who fought in nam right yeah. he was but I, I believe he says he was 17 years old when he joined the marines and mm-hmm. went to nam which i have a thing about um, that later yeah i yeah. saw that <laughs> we'll, we'll, so, we'll yeah, get he's, to that one yeah he, the timeline fits you know he's a middle-aged man uh but yeah so buddy tells him that he's in the navy and then you know because he was a squid uh walter instantly hates <laughs> hates buddy he yeah. doesn't like him <laughs> very well known uh, uh uh, hatred between Marines and, and Navy people that always kind of skirts yeah. the line of like, I don't actually hate you, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about you. Like I hate you all the time. It's right. always been such a weird thing. There's this whole it's movie just... uh, called chasers. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, no, it's a, it's a pretty good, um, kind of overview of that hatred. <laughs> <laughs> does it have an occasion? So that, it doesn't. I wish <laughs> that it doesn't matter. <laughs> cut out that movie reference <laughs> so, so so then then it changes um and we see fancy uh still can't get over that name uh dramatically walking down the stairs singing singing a song some southern racist song most likely um and you're kind of like okay well this is weird uh who's she singing to and you see her around the corner and she's singing to nick cage uh he's uh nice and cozy sitting in his what uh what we deemed as his pass out chair yeah, yeah. um <laughs> he's got some shades on now mind you this is something that he does a lot in the movie uh s- sit in that chair passed out yeah uh <laughs> she uh is wearing like uh like a like a kind of a sheer robe and you can kind of see she's got lingerie under it and she walks up to walter and takes his shades off and turns out he's uh fast asleep which <laughs> pisses her off because Guess what today is? Their anniversary. Asleep or blackout drunk? Tomato, tomato. In her eyes, it's still bad, right? She's pissed. She's pretty pissed off at that part. You know, they they end up making their way upstairs. He chases her upstairs, apologizing, and they have this really awkward, awkward scene that I really didn't understand. I still don't understand what the point of it was because nothing. I mean, yeah, I don't know. She's, A lot you know, of things she's still don't track in this movie for whatever mm-hmm. reason. Yeah. Like, Especially around their relationship. Yeah. So she starts and the ending, you know, like like what oh, actually yeah. happens at the ending, is so confusing. All, every uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're laying the groundwork. <laughs> we're laying the groundwork. This For is nothing. confusing part number one about their relationship, <laughs> in my personal opinion. Uh, she's pretty pissed, right? So they're upstairs. She starts going on this tangent about, you know, she's pissed off that he won't paint their house. He won't mow their lawn and, and he won't make love to her like a, like a real man. Instead, all he does is just sit on his lazy ass and get drunk all day. And so you see this fire just erupting in Walter's eyes and he slams her up against the bedpost and starts telling her not to push him to which she says he doesn't have the balls to hurt her. Uh, and this this is like what kicks off this weird series of actions between the the two of these two freaking lunatics um, <laughs> where they're trying to hurt each other one one way or another, whether it's physically or emotionally or I mean, honestly, at one point when I was watching this movie, I thought all oh, these like this is just a cuckold movie like yeah. Nick Cage <laughs> That's what is I a thought cuckold. it was going to turn into. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I won't spoil that part. You can just stay tuned and find out if I was right. I was aroused the whole time, I'll tell you that, but I won't tell you if I was right or not. Katie so, Strickland, is, uh, uh, she's, she's pretty hot in this movie. Oh, yeah. she's gorgeous. I've never seen her before, and, she, and I, yeah. Yeah, and she did such a Made great me a fan. I mean, she was so good in that role, too. I give a lot of credit to her carrying a lot of the 
pretty <laughs> poorly crafted seeds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was great. Um, so after they exchange those weird words, uh, he leaves her and uh, she immediately spots our, our fresh young hunk of meat out there fixing that fence. Um, she decides, you know what, it's hot outside. I'm going to head down and give him some lemonade like a good old Southern woman does. Uh, <laughs> but before she heads down, she starts playing with the voodoo doll. Um, and you start overhearing reports of a missing, a missing person who matched the description of the gentleman that got shot at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> now, through, through, through every, every screenwriter's best friend, the ambiguous <laughs> off-screen audio yes. of a news broadcast <laughs> yep, yep. for when you want to Breaking inject news. any type of story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> for when you Which, want to inject okay. anything that needs to be said that you forgot to have the characters themselves talk about. Yeah. Just have yeah. a news broadcast, bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Which, which is convenient. It's convenient, right? <laughs> So, uh, you know, she heads downstairs and it cuts to Buddy outside and he's moving a bunch of the broken pieces of fence around. And the camera specifically shows one piece with just blood all over it. And he grabs it. doesn't even think anything of it. He just puts it in the back of the truck. Didn't even like get it on Um, his hand or like what? I mean, yeah, you would think he would notice it in some way. Yeah. And kind of question (laughs) it. But no, no, he's just oblivious. Mm -hmm. You know, he's thinking about that money. So, uh, <laughs> 300 or see, no, $240. <laughs> yeah, 240. Yeah. Minus expenses. Which is, if adjusted <laughs> yeah. for inflation, his original quote was $200, which was $440 in 1988. So, it seems pretty expensive to fix like a six foot section of fence, but I, I don't know. Yeah, what I don't do know, I know? Was it even that? It didn't even seem like that big of a section. Anyways, he, no, he, said, he specifically baby, right? says it's seven feet. Seven oh, okay. feet. You know, it shows that scene. He doesn't even acknowledge the blood. He's whatever. He's like, whatever. Uh, then it then it shows Walter starting to board up the house. And you're like, okay, uh, I guess he's getting ready for the storm. Oh, yeah. He also needs to board up that busted window that that kid jumped through. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, did we bring up that there's a hurricane on the way? I don't well, know they kind of, we well, they say storm. It's, yeah. At first, it's just a storm. Yeah. It's not until like this point where they start talking about the hurricane. Uh, yeah. So gotcha. yeah. Okay. he's he's busy boarding up the house. It's in the south, so you start to kind of get an idea. Okay, well, it's most likely a hurricane or, or a pretty bad storm that's going to be coming through. Um, and then Fancy comes out uh, and gives Buddy the lemonade, and they start talking, and it's super sexually charged and uncomfortable because Nick Cage is in the background the whole time just watching them. <laughs> and that's where I was like, yeah, this movie's just about a dude that likes to watch his wife get nailed. Yeah. Because it's, like, right. really awkward. Uh, mm-hmm. So she comes out, brings out the lemonade, and she introduces herself as Francine May Franklin, or Fancy for short, which I... I the dumbest thing I don't understand why like how does how, anyways <laughs> there's apparently like a uh, when I was watching it with Sheena my wife she talked about a Dolly Parton song where like one of the characters in the Dolly Parton song's name was Fancy as well so apparently it is a common like southern name southern yeah. name yeah I could see sense. it being like a pet name for your kid and then it just sort of becomes your nickname kind of sticks yeah <laughs> yeah I can mm-hmm. see that because yeah. if you got if your name's Francie and it's either like Fran or Franny or mm-hmm. Francie, oh fancy! <laughs> yeah, but for it. a bunch of Yankees like ourselves, fancy is right. pretty stupid. Yeah, it's, just, it's fancy. It's pretty down to us <laughs> up here. Big so, city folk. Oh, it's big city yeah, it's folk. Big city folk <laughs> with our big college degrees. <laughs> So they're both, they both creepily stare at each other uh, in a seductive manner. She ends up you know, taking the glass back, which, okay, I'm glad that you guys noticed this too because this is going to drive me nuts. He drinks like the whole freaking glass yeah. of iced tea, and then it cuts to her about to head back in, and it's almost full again. Yep. And I thought in my head, well, maybe the ice melted because it's hot outside. And I was like, wait, no, the ice is the same. Yeah. <laughs> that threw it's me just off. I was like, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, that's like, you, nobody caught that in editing and decided, what like, is oh, continuity? maybe we should. <laughs> yeah. But then again, $5 million, they got to move on. Let's keep right. moving, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she walks away, and as she walks away, he manages to somehow miss the nail and just hammer his thumb. Well, he's to staring which point, at her you know, ass the whole time, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, 
the angle, the camera <laughs> angle wasn't very good at, at uh, you know, <laughs> setting that up because it really looks like he's just really bad at what he does, which we'll get into. Later. <laughs> so he hammers his nail or he hammers his thumb, screams out. She hears it. She tells him, come inside. We got to get it fixed up. And he's like, no, it's OK. I need to finish this. You know, I've been working on it for like five hours and I've only got like one board nailed in. And, you know, I got to get it done before the storm. But she's like, no, come on. So she gets him inside. She fixes up his thumb. She uh, seductively kisses his boo boo right as Walter walks in, and he has the angriest look on his face. Which, which to my amazing. point, I, yeah. I, and, to, and to my point, like I still thought, okay, this dude just wants his wife to get nailed and wants to hear about it. Like he's he's digging this. Yeah. Uh, then it cuts to Walter just getting hammered on PBR, which, you know, I don't know about you guys, but my personal opinion about PBR is it tastes like piss sandwich. But, you know, well, we can leave that alone. Yeah. So he's Especially getting hammered. warm in the, in the Louisiana sun. Yeah. On the the Louisiana. So he, he's out there getting hammered on PBR, smoking a cigar, which he, he does quite a bit in a weird way. It's like a like a crutch for his character. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as he finishes these PBRs, he starts to place the bottles on a, on the fence post right by buddy where he's working. Um, and he kind of looks at buddy, Buddy looks at him. They share an awkward look and Nick Cage just ends up wandering off. You're like, okay, well, I kind of get, I kind of get where this is going. And then it takes a, a little bit of a, a twist for, from what I originally thought that he's just going to stand on the porch and start hammering it with the pistol, but he's up on the roof shooting with the freaking yeah. hunting rifle, <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. blowing up these bottles right next to buddy and buddy's like, uh, he's like, what the heck man? Like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, and then like has like a huge kind of freak out, but it doesn't stop him from working on the fence. He goes back to working. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but if someone's shooting bottles, yeah, with a rifle, I'm, I'm going to like, I'm going to step aside. I'm like, all right, man, you do you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take right. a flavor. I'm leaving. Not uh, worth $300 but, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to get out of here. Cause you seem a little unhinged and you're hammered on, on beer and God knows what else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. buddy's upset obviously right but then he has like this freak out and nick cage is like oh there he is there he is yeah in this like creepy way <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it cuts to it's dark that was outside such a now. weird you, moment you, for you, me because i was like yeah what so he's he's like oh yeah there you are like the, i got to the real buddy when i fired mm -hmm. a rifle next to him and he got mad at me for it like that's <laughs> yeah, that's the real man there like most, he most is people a perfectly, don't well i would say it's not a perfectly normal reaction because a perfect normal reaction you're like what the fuck and then leave <laughs> yeah. and he just goes what the fuck and then goes back to working uh, yeah so maybe like, maybe he's onto serious, something man? maybe he's like yeah maybe he's like that's the real buddy he's an idiot that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's a damn cuck for my I'm not a her <laughs> bull or whatever they call him. So, okay. So, so then it cuts to it's dark outside, right? And the storm is starting to finally kick up. I don't know anything about like building a fence or woodworking or anything like that, but like it's it's like two boards across <laughs> yep. and seven yep. fence posts. Yeah. How is it taking him so long? Like he's, he okay. said they, it was before one. They make a point. Yeah, he's like, when it's he not started. even 1 a.m. yet. Cause, yeah, because he's like, I don't know, man. I can't finish this today. There's a storm coming. And, and Walter's <laughs> yeah. like, it's not even 1 a.m. yet. Like, the storm's not going to be here till tonight. You're fine. P.M. And he, yeah. and he has all, yeah, he has all the yeah. parts. He has all the wood yeah. in his truck. Like, he's got yeah. everything he needs. Yeah. It's and just it, sawing so, two boards and then hammering in a bunch of posts. Let's track it as if, okay, so storm season in the Gulf hurricane season is like September, which is a longer day. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not not gonna yeah. get dark until at least like seven or so mm -hmm. so right at a minimum he had six hours to work on this fence <laughs> he's not even halfway right. done when it's dark <laughs> and he has to stop doing it but you guys are forgetting right critical things he smashes his thumb he gets hit on by the hot wife <laughs> he gets shot at like these he are does. things that like <laughs> A six hour job, you know, well, it should really be like maybe hour, hour and a half job. You know, that's going to prolong it to a multi-day job because you're dealing with factors that you normally don't deal with. OK, so give him a break. The whole scene with him, like <laughs> getting hit on by the wife, smashing his thumb and getting bandaged and then getting mad. Nick kids getting mad at him is like a five minute exchange, too. Like, it's not. I a, mean, it's in, not in our time, in it. our time, in their time, it had like that was probably a series of four and a half, half hours. hours. <laughs> he was inside getting his thumb taken care of for a couple hours while she was 
trying to get him yeah. to hammer away on her. And they, and they make it a point that when when the storm starts to roll in, it's it's dark out, like the sun's setting. I don't know if it's because mm-hmm. the storm clouds came in and make everything yeah, dark, but like but right after that, it's it's like full on nighttime, like uh-huh. in the yeah, following say, scene. So yeah, following so scene yeah, is he's out like there nighttime. for six six hours or so trying to fix yeah. this section of fence that he doesn't even get like halfway finished with. Maybe yeah. uh, maybe uh, he was like normal speed, but then she did something with that voodoo doll and that made him <laughs> ah, ridiculously no, see, slow. See, you're, mis- you're writing a yeah, better that, movie than what we saw. <laughs> yeah, see, that couldn't happen because that would mean that there's a reason for the voodoo dolls to exist in the movie. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, see, I, foreshad- <laughs> see I, I did proper foreshadowing there where I set something up that we'll talk about later. Yeah. Unlike what this movie did with a bunch of stuff. <laughs> with nearly everything. Yeah. So I just going to point out the fact, like, I think they have money problems. Like, Buddy and his wife have money problems because this dude can't fucking do a damn thing to save his life. <laughs> He's like, cut, like a two hour yeah. job is taking him all day and he can't even get it finished. So <laughs> he goes back inside and tells Walter, Hey man, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't able to finish it. The storm's starting to roll in and Walter is like, okay, man, well, if you got to come back tomorrow, I'm only going to pay you a hundred cause you didn't finish it in the time that we, we agreed upon, which Feels I fair. mean, Feels it's fair. Reason, that's reasonable. Pretty, that's pretty fair, right? You made an agreement with him that yeah. you get it done and you failed to meet that part, yeah. and, but he's all, upset about it you know because he's a loser and a terrible yeah, terrible yeah, yeah. And he needs that and 400. the only way to take care of his baby now is to shake it to get it to stop coughing and so he's just a little <laughs> distracted he's like I, I was trying to avoid this but it's 1988 they don't know any better okay folks? yeah mm-hmm. I, th- but, I think i so, figured out though why buddy is having money problems because it yeah. takes him all day to do a half of a job <laughs> yeah, yeah. which another question Actually, I'll just save it for the couple of questions section. If you <laughs> it's going to be loaded. Make a note. <laughs> it's going to be loaded. Yeah. It's not so, a big one. It's just, we'll get into it later. How many so times he, are we going to do that throughout this? Like, eh, what? Yeah. I'll, I'll save we'll it until we it. ask the questions. Yeah, save it. So he tells Walter he can't finish it. And Walter says, all right, man, well, I'm only going to give you $100 because you didn't meet the agreed upon time frame. Uh, but he's upset. But he's got to go home. He's like, whatever. He he heads out to his truck, and of course, his truck doesn't start. He opens the hood. I don't know why he opened the hood. He looks in there. Uh, apparently, everything looks fine. I don't know why he bothered opening it. Um, I'm guessing yeah, he I wouldn't know how implying, to fix it anyway. I thought they were <laughs> right. It would take it would take him two days to fix it. Somebody his truck or something. I guess. Like, I, I guess, but it. like he doesn't say anything. He just like opens the hood, right? And he's and then goes yeah. inside because he's getting soaked. It's starting to rain now. He's getting he's getting drenched. Yeah. So he goes back inside. Um, back into the lunatic's house he's like you know this this is a good idea i'm gonna go back inside this dude was shooting at me earlier his wife is eye fucking me uh i hammer my thumb looking at her ass while he watched uh i'll hang out with these guys all night yeah that'll be good it's probably safe in there Uh, they'll let me they'll they'll let me stay until i can figure something out i so i got the uh, the impression that they did something to his truck to keep him that's there. what i thought yeah too. that's yeah. what i thought too it you know it just does, doesn't get brought back up really about sabotage act two it's about time we had some conflict wouldn't you say act two this these the acts of this movie are kind of broken up into flashing back into the present which is really nice made it easy to take a note so we cut back to um the police station where uh foghorn fraser crane uh <laughs> continues continues grilling but this time there's another detective listening in from another room and it turns out that buddy has had some issues with the law in the past when he robbed a liquor store with a spray painted bb gun casting doubt on his own why did he have to spray paint the bb gun like i think to spray paint the the orange tip so it looked like an actual gun i'm guessing i don't think they did that in 1988 though yeah i remember being like guns yeah even now bb guns typically don't have uh, orange uh, tip on the barrel. It's no yeah, longer you're right, just you're airsoft. Right. There's a little, there's, I don't know, maybe maybe it was like already a weird colored BB gun. It, yeah, maybe the script writer forgot. They, they <laughs> said it in 1988 for no reason. He it up, dude. He's fighting the Viet Cong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This, it wouldn't have happened yet. Well, it might have. Yeah, yeah. I guess he was only in his 20s, so Vietnam would have happened. Um, Kelsey Grammer says something like, you know, 
uh, well, what would have happened if I hadn't given you the liquor? Because it sets up that that he was going to get liquor because his dad ran out and he didn't want his dad to beat him, so he had to go steal liquor uh, by holding up a, a liquor store. Uh, but he goes, well, I guess I never, I guess I never thought about it. <laughs> I kinda, if, if he hadn't given me the liquor, I kind of took that to to kind of set up some sort of like almost like a conflict between him and Nick Cage because he sees Nick Cage to be sort of like his father, who he hates, obviously. Mm-hmm from this scene mm-hmm. ah, yeah I didn't get that but yeah that could, that would make sense because his Nick Cage is a drunk and mm-hmm. a violent angry drunk so mm-hmm. it would make sense but it's a thread that doesn't really go anywhere no. so we gave no, it, 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 it more thought than the room <laughs> <laughs> well we do, we do uh, kind of like um, uh, we do address it later on with the, the story that he tells Fancy when she's in the bathtub about his mom and stuff but we'll get to uh, that yeah yeah but that mm. still doesn't have bearing on not really no. <laughs> right. yeah. um, all right so as we established buddy heads back inside with uh, Walter and fancy and asks Walter if he can borrow his car and leave his truck behind so he can check on his wife and baby uh, Walter delivers one of the best lines in the movie or I should say Nick Cage delivers one of the best lines in the movie what do you think I just let you pull some backdoor trade with a beat up truck while you steal my Mach 1 Mustang <laughs> 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 he does the lit thing. He does the laugh. I, I love that. Again, they say acting is a series of choices, and Nick Cage makes the best choices that I've ever seen. And that <laughs> yeah. uh, is definitely the, uh, a Nick Cage. I think it only happens three times in the movie, but it makes such an impact. <laughs> it does. That, that I specifically requested, independently of, of what we were all doing, that Patrick pull it for a sound bite, and he already had. So it was it's, it's a very memorable moment. To me, it was like his like uh, him making fun of this kid because he's young and like mm-hmm. being like, oh, that's how kids talk these days. They're a little punks who <laughs> walk around you yeah. know so yeah. i don't know <laughs> buddy calls his wife and she gets pissed at him for being the huge loser he clearly is <laughs> which is totally fair because he's only having to stay with these weirdos because he's slow as hell and he couldn't p- finish replacing seven feet of wooden fence despite working at it for multiple hours uh, she also makes a great point about him not being able to call a cab which he says he can't for some reason yeah why why couldn't he just call the cab <laughs> yeah. and left i mean the storm hadn't really he, kicked in yet it was just maybe sprinkling a little bit and i know from yeah. experience because i live in the south for a little while that things will operate up until the storm starts to get a little bad so they don't just right. like call out for the whole day and just like oh it's going to be stormy today let's not let's not uh drive anybody it's you know they work until they can't i assume it's because he had no money uh, yeah that's what i figured that's, and obviously that's, Big I mean, cage isn't going to spot him some money I yeah. they could have addressed it, yeah they could have uh, taken two lines of dialogue why can't you call a cab? I don't have any money. Yeah, I ain't got no cash. I don't cash. want to get into it right now. Yeah. I'm still working <laughs> on this damn here. fence. Yeah. So anyway, he decides to, to shack up with this couple because why not? <laughs> I'll point out here, like, I tend to like this setup in movies. Um, and, and, and Wicker Man kind of did the same thing where it's like, it's not necessarily stranger in a strange land type of setting, but it's like normal person in a weirdo's like environment. I guess mm-hmm. it kind of is stranger in a strange land. But like Dracula is another example where it's framed that some guy shows up at Dracula's castle and everything seems normal and then it just goes crazier as things go on. So um, this movie kind of had that as well. He's a normal repairman. He shows up. Things aren't quite what they seem. It's a cool... I, I, I like that type of framing for a storyline. Um, that's just me yeah. personally. Wicker Man was something similar. So I know yeah. it was a nice distinction or a nice relation between between the two movies that have that same type of setup. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's not related to anything. I just wanted to point it in. Anyway, Walter offers him a drink and Buddy tells him he doesn't drink, probably because he has an alcoholic father. Yep. Um, but then decides mm-hmm. to hang out with the nutcases for the night to ride out the storm instead of finding a way to get home to his sick wife or sick kid and frigid wife. <laughs> so, he does take the yeah, drink though. So yeah. he does. Yeah, that's important. He does take the drink, even though he says he doesn't drink. <laughs> Um, they have meatloaf at an awkward family dinner and they talk about Walter and how Walter and Fancy met, which pisses Walter off for a reason that's never explained in the film. Um, Fancy explains that she was a jazz singer in New Orleans and he used to be an alluring mix of strength, courage, and hope, but times have changed. Uh, I, I didn't Buddy get explains, why he was like instantly pissed off about that. I didn't either. I thought it was going to be a setup for something later on in the movie, yeah. but it wasn't. It's like he just didn't want, maybe he didn't want her getting closer to Buddy by explaining the story of their background. 
but that makes sense, he I seems guess. to get irrationally, irrationally angry about her. <laughs> like, it's not a bad story. I thought that was the other thing, too. Like, he didn't like how they met for some reason or another, but it's just that she was a jazz singer in a club and he came and saw her perform one time and they, they hooked up. I'd be pretty proud, explains, of, proud of that uh, meet cute. That's a pretty good story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Buddy explains he's been his wife since they've been in sixth grade, and Walter says it's idiotic to only sleep with one woman, and they probably will be divorced when he turns 30. Not a terrible Ooh. point. <laughs> uh, fa fancy offers to make everyone mint juleps, while Walter and Buddy, even though Buddy just said in the same scene he doesn't drink, mm -hmm. uh, takes the julep and drinks it. The two men gab about some fun stuff, like how it makes sense that Buddy likes baseball since it's a soft sport, uh, and he can tell Buddy is having problems at home and wonders when the last time it was that he had his cock sucked. Just idle chit chat. <laughs> he also says he can tell Buddy wants to fuck his wife. Again, you know, just idle chit chat. Yeah, just as you do. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what, what other kind of small talk would you have in this scenario? Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, okay. Some fancy footwork ensues as she plays footsie with Buddy under the table in front of Walter, who storms out of the room once again to cozy up in his passing out chair. We hear another news report talking about the same missing person, but the report also <laughs> discloses that he is the fourth person to go missing lately. Grand Isle seems to have their own news station. Only 1,500 people live there. Yeah, so <laughs> I looked up some statistics, and um, maybe they're not talking about the real Grand Isle. Um, maybe this is like their fictional version of Grand Isle, but the actual Grand Isle is at the very tip of Louisiana, like way down at, at the very like, you know, f flood prone region down there at the end. And there's only 1500 people that live there. And like, it seems like the population just keeps falling because of probably hurricanes and flooding right. and horrible stuff. So if there's only 1500 people living there, you wouldn't think they would have their own TV station just for that little area. It would <laughs> yeah, be right. something close, close by, like, I don't know, Shreveport or what, I don't know what's actually close by there, but like a, right. a major town of some sort. Right. <laughs> also, there's only 1,500 right. people who live in this town and four different teenagers have gone missing. Like, don't you think it would be pretty easy to like figure out, uh, to connect Not the dots? If, uh... <laughs> Not if the detective is Kelsey Grammer. Uh, that's true. <laughs> Trying to figure that's it out. <laughs> uh, Fancy tucks Walter in and then leads Buddy on a tour of the house that ends up in their bedroom, but not before passing a door with like 20 locks on it that leads to the basement. Fancy explains that there are bad things that have happened down there before laughing it off. <laughs> Fancy tells Buddy in the bedroom that that's her favorite room in the house, and then she tells him she's going to slip into something more comfortable because screenwriting is hard. <laughs> Buddy, a stranger in their house, sits on Walter and Fancy's bed while she changes behind a screen four feet away from him. He then spots a bunch of creepy voodoo dolls scattered around the room that he apparently thinks nothing. Fancy proceeds to explain that she's always wanted a big family, but the Lord didn't grant her the ability to have kids of her own. So she seduces Buddy and goes, and he goes along with it until she touches his crotch, which causes Buddy to try and leave and he falls on the floor. This wakes Walter up, who slowly creeps up the stairs. <laughs> As some more fancy footwork, not only unbuttons Buddy's <laughs> pants with her heel, but also snaps the button off entirely. Like, His pants appear undamaged some, in every subsequent some, like, shot in the film. Crazy <laughs> control on that heel to like right. pop yeah. that little button off of I his pants. Look at it, it broke it off, and the button goes flying across the room under the door. But and then his pants I'd are say, fine the whole rest of the movie. Pants are not, mm -hmm. yeah, it's never addressed again. I, I thought it was going to come like he's going to try and run and, and his pants are going to fall down yeah, or something. something you like know, that. He's set up or for he'd something come downstairs on. and walk in front of Walter and his pants are just like button, <laughs> unbuttoned and right. open. He can't, uh, he can't button his pants back up even though he's trying. So, But no, it's never we, addressed. We should again. also address the fact that this is the very last time that those voodoo dolls are ever shown or mentioned uh, this never comes up again. Yeah. I, they're never like, actually what mentioned. They're just the show. point of showing those voodoo dolls. Yeah. If, it's because they're in the <laughs> South. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I uh, thought, uh, spoilers, but we, like, I thought maybe it like each one of them represented a victim of uh, France, Fanny and fa <coughs> Fancy and yeah. Walter. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure at some point. I'm sure at some point in the script they did and there was something more to go or she yeah. was you know it's to show that she practices voodoo like she's trying to to have a kid through voodoo or something but it's never never fleshed out so it's possible yeah. that there was a much better screenplay at the beginning before editing so 
I guess yeah. we shouldn't um, shouldn't rip on it too much. Uh, Balter listens at the door for a while, but apparently doesn't care enough about what's going on inside, and he leaves. Um, again, maybe it's like setting up that he's 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 got the cuck fetish. Like he he wants this I to happen. You. He knows what's going on in there, but he leaves I intentionally saw, knowing what's yeah. going on. I saw a smile but, on his face as he had his ear to that door. <laughs> she's getting it. You she's going to tell me about it so. later. <laughs> Um, maybe he wanted to like girls. catch them in the act or something like like that was the plan was like oh I have justification to kill this guy if I catch him in the act mm-hmm. um, but maybe. I don't hear anything going on in there so I'll just go down and nail up some more boards <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> um the buddy heads downstairs, curls up for a nice restful sleep right next to Walter's passing out chair, which to me is like, why is that the place that he decides to sleep uh, after? Right. I don't know. It's just and he's also right like, by what, the considering what window. just happened. Yeah. And considering what just happened, he just leaves and goes to bed like mm-hmm. I'd be seriously creeped out. That was a good um, point. Vince he, is like he's sleeping <laughs> next to an open window that's yeah. been busted out from the night before <laughs> yeah. during a hurricane, like, during a hurricane, sleeping yeah. next to the passing out chair all bad decisions this guy is an idiot he's the dumbest character (laughs) (laughs) well anyway he's woken up sometime later by thunder where he finds Walter sitting next to him holding a gun while watching Buddy sleep Um, Walter says he thought but he and Buddy might go get a drink and have a little talk in the attic Remember, Buddy doesn't drink. Buddy accepts. Well, I mean, he has a uh, gun Walter's man cave. pointed at him at the time. Yeah, yeah, I guess at that point it's all <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, Walter's man cave is elegantly decorated dart by, with a dartboard and a beautiful stained glass window. Enough rifles to arm a small militia. Also, the stained glass window was not boarded up for some reason, even though it's probably the biggest window in the house. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's an important point later. Uh, and the nicest seems window to sort in the of, house. Like, yeah, that's and the, right. like the one that you wouldn't want that, to get broken. Walter seems to sort of unbutton his pants, and then he sits down in the chair. <laughs> did you guys um, see that? I don't know what the point of that was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> What I didn't know what the point of that was either. This is what I thought. To make oh, fun of. it's a reverse cuck. So he's the one that wants to get banged <laughs> by Buddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's never, maybe it's just a Nick Cage thing to make the scene more uncomfortable or something. Yeah. Uh, honestly, yeah, I think really it's because uh, Nick Cage has put on some pounds and I don't think that, uh, <laughs> I, I think he, his pants are digging into his gut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to unbutton my pants. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, actually, I don't I don't think he should. Oh, you're doing it. Okay, no, it's fine. It's fine. Do it. I'm going to pull a Louis C.K. No, here. No one will notice. <laughs> it's okay if I masturbate in front of you. Right? Yeah. Is that all right? You said yes. <laughs> you said um, $400. <laughs> I'll give you an extra 100 <laughs> Just watch uh, me play with it a little. <laughs> Anyway, after after adjusting his pants, he asks Buddy if he ever thinks about his own death, as you do. He says he chose Buddy for a reason, because he knew that he was on the USS Stark, which was apparently attacked in Iraq in 1987 by a fighter jet, which killed 37 people and injured 21 more. Quick fact, this appears to be the only reason this movie is set in 1988. Yeah. Uh, I thought that, that was, was set in 88 as a both for that and because they needed the character to be a Vietnam vet yeah. and also mm-hmm. they needed an explanation of why he couldn't just like call the police or something or I don't know like mm-hmm. I, a lot <laughs> of times it, movies... to make it more convenient that he was trapped at this house maybe because yeah. there was yeah. less modes of communication back then a lot of times um, nowadays it seems like movies are set in the past just to get rid of the cell phone plot hole like because there's mm-hmm. yeah so many ways to get a hold of people to let people know what's going on and all that kind of stuff but back then right you know a lot of people don't remember the dark ages when we all just had a one phone in the house and that was the only uh-huh. way you could contact somebody which was amazing in a lot of circumstances and i really wish we could go back to it but at the same <laughs> yeah. time yeah, yeah. Walter then explains that his military career was ended by friendly fire when he was 17. Uh, Two weeks after he was sent home, his entire squad was killed in Vietnam, and he wishes he could have died with them. So he's got some survivor's guilt. Uh, Instead, he had the misfortune of marrying a gorgeous rich woman who owns a giant house. Womp womp. Uh, what yeah, a like sad they, life I think at Walter. one point Fancy talks about Awful. like this house has been in her family for like 150 years. So like, and obviously Walter doesn't have a job, so they're independently wealthy. It doesn't look like either of them work, and they're 
They're yeah. just rich loners, and his life sucks, apparently. <laughs> hey, so apparently, like, right. I wasn't positive. We'll, we'll bring this up in a couple of questions, but it seems like they're on some land or something because there doesn't seem to be any neighbors, which is, you know, when he shoots yeah. the guy and he falls through his fence, none of right. the neighbors no seem one to knows. notice at all. So right. I'm guessing that they have And apparently they're rich enough for this guy to try and rob him in the first place. Yeah. So. But yeah, they're not well, secluded enough t- for a couple of lone Girl Scouts to wander up to the front door <laughs> at the very beginning That's of the journey. I mean, they got to make their sales. <laughs> yeah, they got to make their sales. They're going to go door to door. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I kind of figured that the property was like an old southern property, either a plantation, like at some a plantation. Point, or just family. I mean, a lot, especially in Louisiana, a lot of families would buy large lots of land mm-hmm. um, and then pass it on right. down the generations. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like they really did want to isolate this whole story by <laughs> being in the mm-hmm. south being in an area where you would have family-owned property with nobody's around you for miles and there's no technology uh that we have today because it's set in eight you know 1988 uh, so at this point i actually paused the movie and i did some research and some math Walter says that the attack that wiped out his squad was in Da Nang. Um, U.S. Marines came ashore at Da Nang in 1965, putting this as the absolute earliest date when Walter's squad could have been attacked. If Walter was 17 when he went to war, and this movie is taking place in 1988, that means that the oldest Walter could possibly be is 40. Nicolas Cage was about 55 when this movie was filmed. I present these facts with no further comment. (laughs) He's the ageless wonder. (laughs) Well, you know, all that drinking really made for a haggard 40 year old just <laughs> which right. to be fair it, it could really and realistically i mean you see people that are alcoholics they tend to look older because of the damage mm-hmm. that they're doing to their body yeah but I uh i mean i thought I he was in his 30s f- <laughs> the way he looked you know my I mean, thought was gonna be <laughs> my, one of my thoughts was that maybe they originally wrote this with a younger actor in mind and they Possibly, ended up yeah. getting Nicolas Cage be, and we're yeah. like, we can't turn down Nicolas Cage. So we'll just make it, yeah. work. We'll make uh, it work. But I was like, wait a minute, this is only the eighties and he was 17. He shouldn't be that old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was doing the math too. Um, I was like, uh, <laughs> this makes sense. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I carried on. I feel like 1988 yeah. comes from, because they had to, they wanted to do something with both of them having military experience. And there was kind of a gap mm-hmm, right. there between, Vietnam and like the Iraq war and stuff, but they had this USS Stark thing that happened. And uh, yeah. right. this was the one way that they, they could kind of bring those characters together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they could have said it in like the Korean war or something and have something happen, you know, set it like 10 years further back. Cause that was the fifties or sixties or whatever. Mm-hmm. But anyway, nobody knows about the Korean war. Everybody cares about the Vietnam war. So it makes sense. Hey, I've seen match. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so through this prodding, um, Buddy is is coaxed to regale a war story of his friend burning to death, to which Walter angrily rails against the government because they gave soldiers nothing in return for their service. So that's the first point, first part of which this sort of makes its way into the plot, that you see that mm-hmm. Walter is the bitter Vietnam vet because he got shit on for everything that they tried to do for the country, even though he was just a 17-year-old who didn't really see any action and got discharged <laughs> on a medical injury and sent home. So he didn't right. really get to do a lot uh, I, I don't know if you guys military. have noticed but in in my life i've seen a lot of this where it's like somebody who was in the military for like barely any time and didn't see any action those are the people who seem to be the most like hardcore military everything like we've got to support our troops and they, like they're those are the people who like rail against any kind of like mm. uh, anti-troops anti-military anything I don't if I haven't I haven't noticed that. But if that's true, then then maybe this is more accurate than <laughs> I gave it credit for. So that's fine. Uh, yeah, I think it's a little good. bit of guilt of not being able to to serve in the capacity that they want yeah. to. So they, they they you know they feel more vested in making sure that people appreciate the the folks that are able to actually carry on and have a career in the military, whether it's twenty years or four years. I also yeah. think maybe there's some psychological like they didn't they weren't exposed to the horrors of of war the same way that people who had to serve those multiple years were so maybe they still glorify it more in a way that yeah. <laughs> actual combat veterans are more jaded and they don't want to think about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
At this point, Walter chucks a bag of money at Buddy's feet, tells him he'll give him $20,000 to kill his wife to save her from dying slowly from blood blood cancer. Um, he gives Buddy a rag and some cyanide and explains how cyanide works in a way that only Nicolas Cage would. <laughs> um, he tells her, he tells her just, he tells her just pour it on the rag, put it on her face, hold it there, she'll, she'll go to sleep and she'll die. Yeah. That's a pretty accurate um, presentation of how he's <laughs> okay hold on hold on I gotta, I gotta stop real quick like just a quick why would he uh, I, I, I won't say this to the end because it's not it doesn't need that much time but like why would he trust that he could actually accomplish this if he couldn't build a fence <laughs> <laughs> Well, this apparently, is like, he's what? more successful at getting close enough to fuck his wife than anything he attempted with the fence. So it actually might be more plausible than, than well, not. I guess. But you're asking a, you're asking a guy who, who spent time on a ship, on a Navy ship, who had no hand to hand combat, had no, you know, he wasn't in any firefights. Yeah. Like he, this dude wasn't trained to kill. He was he was most likely a maintenance member or somebody that, you know, supporting yeah. staff of that ship. You go in to ask this guy to commit murder. <laughs> Just and we've already established the he thinks Buddy is soft and thinks he's a pussy yeah. because he, yeah. you know. So yeah. why would he entrust he knows him about to do it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, sure. I had some questions about this because, like, so this was the plan all along. Obviously, he's been planning right. to have to, to pay he's Buddy got this to bag kill his of money wife in the attic this whole ready time. To go give this spiel. So all these convenient little things that happened to keep Buddy there were obviously done by Nick Cage. Mm-hmm. Or so it right. seems. So it seems. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's called the or, tease or, in the industry, right? Yeah, or at least it was in an, in an earlier version of the. Uh, <laughs> so at this point, I then also stopped and I googled, "Is inhaling cyanide deadly?" Because I wasn't sure if you could kill people that way or just you know ingest. I've only heard of ingesting cyanide, but I guess cyanide gas yeah. is also a thing. But I didn't think about it. So now that that's in my search history, I hope no one I know <laughs> dies by cyanide poisoning anytime <laughs> soon, because I will become a primary suspect. <laughs> <laughs> I also Googled blood cancer symptoms because I didn't know what blood can if blood cancer was a real thing. So I really hope that the symptoms of blood cancer don't mimic cyanide poisoning <laughs> and that nobody I know dies of blood cancer as well because both of those, if we have, if there's a detective investigating it that's not Kelsey Grammer, I will probably be suspect number one. <laughs> did, did you find out? Does it actually, if you inhale it, will you die uh, from it? Yes, you can. You, that is actually the number one cause of people dying by cyanide is some accidental inhalation of some chemical that puts off cyanide gas um, and well, kills them. So, yes. Then I have a question about a scene that's coming up. A pretty big question. <laughs> yes, yes uh, I do too. So, so, so it was true. You could just pour it on a rag, put it over her mouth, and presumably kill her. Um, so they did their research there. Um, just like I was forced to do. Um, but he immediately agrees to kill Fancy, and he heads down to her room to do the deed. Fancy's taking a bath and singing along to Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. By the way, what the hell time is it? I wondered this as well. Because I, I had this question so many hours times. hours later. Because <laughs> it was they, they had, dark. So they the, went to the, the, the yeah, eight, <laughs> and then he came fell in, asleep. Night falls. Then he fell asleep, then they woke up, then she seduced him in the bedroom. Or no, he she seduced him in the bedroom, then he went down, fell asleep, woke mm -hmm. up, went up, had the chat with Nicolas Cage, um, who was still awake because he'd been sitting in the pass out chair. Mm -hmm. Then Francie, your fancy is still awake, not only awake, but drinking tons of wine and sitting in the bath singing a song. So mm -hmm. it's got to be like three or four in the morning that, or that's something. That's what I thought. I was like, point. yeah, at least like yeah. two or three somewhere in there. Yeah. At this point, I seriously was like, are these vampires? Like, are these characters? <laughs> is that what the setup is going to be? Because there's blood cancer and they're doing this weird thing yeah. where they're like, you know, they're up mm -hmm. all night and they and she's mm -hmm. like seducing him and doing weird voodoo. I thought there was seriously going to be a third act twist where there was some supernatural aspect to these two characters and why they're so bizarre. You um, know, Nick Cage's we'll, beard we'll and, that, and his hair kind of makes him look like a <laughs> vampire, too. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, spoilers, no, they're not. That, that's too interesting. <laughs> um, but anyway, so they have this chat. Stay tuned. Um, before then, Buddy watches her from the doorway like a teenager who's just walked into a girl's locker room. Fancy beckons him in and says that it's a scar on her leg. Um, it's from her mom stabbing her with a fork for not minding her manners at the dinner table. Um, again, a little piece of character set up that goes nowhere. It doesn't doesn't yeah. mean anything in the movie. It's just there. I... I 
I didn't even notice the scar when I saw it, but I kind of feel like maybe the actress has a scar on her leg for real, and they wanted to put that in something. It kind of felt like <laughs> something like that. I got um, the impression that they just wanted to show her legs and like mm-hmm. for Buddy to be ogling her and and staring right. at her legs. But she's in already bath. in the bath, so yeah. there's already but a she's perfectly soaked up logical setup for him for her, for her, him seeing her legs. You know, um, Buddy then says that his childhood was also messed up, and he recounts the story of his mom dying in a boating accident when he was six and his dad blaming uh, the kids for it and drinking himself into a coma. Uh, he also points out his dad is still in a coma right now. So I wonder if that's a recent thing that's happened and his dad has just fallen into a coma um, or it's he's just been in a coma for years after alcohol poisoning. It doesn't matter, ultimately, of course. Is that really right. a thing? Can you actually to... like, drink yourself into a coma? Yes, you can. There's a, yeah. um, a co-worker of my wife uh, did that uh, over quarantine because apparently servers just there's tons of alcoholics that work in like the serving industry or in the mm. bartending industry. Who would have thought? Yeah. So this guy was a total alcoholic. He got laid off because the restaurant shut down and he just turned to basically doing nothing but drinking for like three months straight. And he ended up yeah, drinking himself into a coma and then he died in the wow. hospital. So you can't, it basically, it basically gives you brain damage and then you, mm-hmm. you know, you go into a coma and you don't wake up. Jeez. So again, something that was eerily accurate for yeah. the script. Like they, they did their research. Yeah. Um, Surprising. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah. So this, this story of, of his mom dying and his dad being an alcoholic to the point of almost dying apparently gets fancy all sorts of moist because she immediately sleeps with Buddy on the floor of the bathroom with Walter in the next room. Because Walter's at this point following because he is expecting Buddy to kill his wife and so he wants to make sure that he does. Yeah. And then he sees them having sex and then just lets them have sex, I guess. It doesn't doesn't try to stop it. Um, I mean, again, his motivations are slightly I, unclear. I got the impression that he was just like, he was downstairs just waiting nervously. But again, that doesn't track right. with things that happen later on. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Even Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Crane thinks this is fucked up as we bookend Act 2 by returning to the present in the police station with Buddy and the detective. Buddy justifies the whole thing by saying it had been six months since he'd had sex with his wife uh, and that fancy is crazy, but sexier than hell. This is also not a terrible point. Um, he then explains that he only survived the night by pitting Fancy and Walter against each other. So now we've come through the second act and we are set up for the glorious denouement and conflict resolution <laughs> that definitely doesn't come out of nowhere uh, and leave more questions than answers <laughs> for the final act, act of three the resolution this is where shit gets really weird um yes it, it goes off yeah. the rails completely so fancy and buddy wake up naked on the floor again what the fuck time is it what time is it because they fell asleep so yeah he had, he had he had <laughs> dinner, dark out. Uh, yeah, got seduced dark. by her, went and took a nap, woke up, hung out with Nick Cage for a bit, went into the bathroom, hung out with her, then had sex with her, then fell asleep and woke up, still dark out. So mm-hmm. what the hell time is it? <laughs> yeah. Fancy spots the cyanide. <laughs> it's like he didn't even put it in his pocket. He's just, uh, <laughs> it's just on the floor. Over here. <laughs> Buddy asks if she's actually sick. Um, she, of course, says no and immediately heads downstairs to confront Walter. Walter is busy nailing more boards up for some reason, like, cause like he had yeah, boards already up. It's been like 12 hours. <laughs> it's been 12 hours, the hurricane's well underway and he's still boarding up the house. <laughs> I don't know if it's been 12 hours. It's been multiple hours as we've yeah, established. It's, 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 it's gotta be close to morning. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and he's it's still trying to be reaching the towards like the end of the hurricane, I would assume. I don't know. <laughs> right. I guess maybe not. He's shocked when he sees his still alive wife come downstairs with Buddy after having been missing for quite some time. Uh, assumably, <laughs> uh, not that much time, but enough time to make him question what the hell he was doing all that time. Cage gives Buddy the best glare of the movie. Uh, I love that shot so much. That just creepy stare, yeah. like right at him. Uh, that shot to it's in me, the trailer. That shot's that, in that the trailer. deserves at least a one on Rotten Tomatoes. It's also the poster. Is that glare yeah, at him? Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. yeah. and Buddy just shrugs. <laughs> Just uh, shoves it off. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What are you I mean, gonna do? She's hot. Look at her. <laughs> I don't want to kill her. Okay. 
Fancy tells Walter that they need to come to a new place of understanding with each other, that they should forgive each other and that ha that she has nothing but love for him. She then immediately stabs him in the hand with a survival knife, which Walter takes about as good as you would expect. <laughs> he, he knocks Fancy out and pulls a gun on Buddy, tries to force Buddy to complete the job of killing his wife by telling him to pour the cyanide on the rag. Pour it on the rag! <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's another excellent, that's the first, amazing... I think that's the first Nick Cage freak out in the movie. Like, <laughs> the first time he gets to let loose and do a Nick Cage yeah. level uh, line reading. Suddenly, a very convenient tree limb busts through the window and Buddy splashes the cyanide into Walter's eyes wrestles the gun away from him, throws him to the ground, and very fakely punches him in the face before choking him out. <laughs> I mean, we could save this for a couple of questions, but wouldn't the cyanide have killed Walter? I mean, he yeah. splashes a bottle yep. into his it's face. Right in his face, like in his mm -hmm. eyes, in his mouth, into, into his, his nose. Eyes, into his nose, in his mouth. Yeah. He would have died, And I right? know, like, cyanide, you, you put cyanide in your mouth, it kills you in seconds. Like, that's the whole point mm -hmm. of why they used fake cyanide capsules in their teeth or whatever, so they could just bite down on it and die. And I've yeah. I got I to gotta wonder, I didn't Google this because I wasn't going to Google, can inhaling cyanide kill you and then can getting cyanide <laughs> poured in your face kill you? Because <laughs> that would definitely tip off the NSA. Uh, but I got to assume when you get it into your eyes, like, that's mucous membranes that goes right into your, your system and would probably oh, yeah. have just killed him. Yeah, you <laughs> would think so I mean, I don't know. I, I think that would have been instant death, but I am I'm no expert. Apparently Nigel is though. Although <laughs> Yeah, Nigel knows everything about Although, Cyanide. I guess there could be <laughs> that's the, Nigel Anderson. You know, <laughs> James Nigel Anderson. Although given we haven't gotten there yet, but the twist that's about to happen, given that twist, maybe there wasn't actually cyanide in the bottle. Maybe yeah, that's, it was that, just a that is something that I thought of too. Um, Grandmama's mint julep. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy then ties Walter to the banister of the stairs where Walter asks Buddy to slay him. I, I love that, that read too. It was like, kill me. I'm ready. Slay me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> slay me. I'm ready. Uh, Buddy and Fancy begin to run off together in Walter's Mustang in the middle of a hurricane in one of the most flood prone, prone, flood prone regions on, on Earth. But Buddy stops when Walter tells Fancy to let Buddy in on her dirty little secrets. Which is, this is where shit goes really off the fucking rails. Yes. Fancy tries to get Buddy to take her in front of Walter and look him right in the eye while Buddy makes her come, which I was really hoping would happen. <laughs> I mean, just to Me ratchet too. up the <laughs> insanity. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, like, the whole time this movie's playing out, I'm like, this is just a cuck story. I'm telling you. Yeah, and then when she said that, I was like, yes, they're gonna yeah, do I it. I thought this was like, uh, this is their anniversary gift to each other. Like, they yeah, do this every too. year. Me like this is I something thought that's that where this just... is going. Nope. Yeah. nope. He pusses out. He's a soft nope. man nope. who likes baseball and can't hammer his wife <laughs> in front of him. Uh, uh, thankfully, the movie knew a different way to ratchet up the insanity. Uh, <laughs> Buddy tell, or Walter tells Buddy to have a look in the basement, and as soon as he does, Fancy starts blasting at him. <laughs> she shoots it at him a couple of times, and he jumps into a storeroom that comes equipped with its own drugged-out guy, who is all yeah. hopped up on... I couldn't hear the line properly, but I looked it it's, up. It's a fertility yeah. drug of some mm -hmm. sort. So I, I had I had closed captioning going for this whole movie okay. to make it easier to, to track the cursing. <laughs> and it literally, when he says like, it just says inaudible <laughs> in the closed caption. Like it doesn't even tell you the one time I wanted to actually know what was being said, it literally just says inaudible. So it's not important apparently. Oh my God. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I think, I'm not positive, but I think that was the guy from the beginning, right? That was it the was. dude who was yeah. He's, he's wearing the same hoodie. It's the teenager that got shot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in the last news update, I think they specifically call out what he was wearing, which is like a black yes. tracksuit with See, white. I remember this guy. Yep, and he has the white stripes down the I arm. I remember that from this the beginning, the same guy. but I wasn't. I don't remember it from that scene yeah. if he was still wearing that yeah. same tracksuit. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, this, I thought, it's a guy I didn't that got know shot. that she, he was being given drugs. I thought she was taking his blood or he was hooked up like he had because he had a well, he had there was like, like blood IV coming out of coming the, down. Yeah, he, he had did. You're right. I thought he was like 
Yeah, which fertility drug you, makes sense. We'll yeah. get to it later. Yeah. Um, very odd but, uh, at the moment, but then it made sense down the road. But again, I thought like, oh, fuck, they're vampires. Like she's draining his blood <laughs> into a thing and he's just being kept alive as like human chattel so that they can continue mm-hmm. to, to milk him for blood or whatever. Yeah, I thought blood. Uh, but again, maybe it would, was like the cancer thing was true. And so they were just uh, yeah, she was using transfusions, they were doing transfusions, yeah. which would Another be convenient. Another better story. So, yeah. Yeah. Both of these are facets of a better movie. <laughs> How lucky this burglar has the same blood type as you, honey. <laughs> yeah. But apparently he's just laying there drugged yeah. and yeah. So sort of The drug down guy it. explains that he's been there for days, which I don't know if that tracks with the hiring of Buddy for the fence, because I thought that it was the next day, but apparently yeah. it's been days. I thought days. they specifically call out in one of the news reports that the teenager had been missing for four days. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, that makes sense. So I'm taking a sweet time getting that fence built. He also says... <laughs> He also says there are more people like him in the house, which is interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. He also has a piece of cloth in his hand with Japanese writing of some sort. Uh, Well, we don't know if it's Japanese or or Chinese or whatever at that point. We just know that it's some sort of uh, Asian writing on like a little piece of cloth. Unless you speak Japanese or Chinese, I guess you would get that instantly. But I don't know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> then Walter and Fancy have a conversation that makes it seem as though this whole night has been some, some sort of game that they've been playing with Buddy. I yeah. like that was this is where things go kind of <laughs> off the rails because like, OK, so was he actually paying? Was he actually planning on ma- killing his wife or was that actually water yeah. in that thing? Was he just trying to see if if Buddy had the stones to actually try and kill her and then they were going to like do something where they're like oh you really were going to try and kill my wife or you know something mm-hmm. like that but apparently not it's like they were somehow both playing a game but they were two different games <laughs> but they both knew that they were playing a game together and I, yeah. it doesn't and also it, it doesn't this whole really subplot of like uh well we'll get to it um yeah buddy heads to the attic to find a gun instead of running out the front door <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, okay. Um, he shoots at Walter with a fresh clip that apparently only had one bullet in it because it immediately is out of bullets or it jammed mm-hmm. conveniently. They don't really explain, but um, they go round and round before I guess another convenient branch hits the stained glass window. I wasn't sure what was it happening there. It just le- I immediately the wind just, broke. just blew it open. How yeah. That, yeah. that doesn't happen. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you can. It can if you don't. If you don't properly board your stuff up, you can cause uh, pressure pressure differentials that will cause other things to break. So maybe it actually did happen because the window downstairs broke open with the branch hmm. that caused that could cause a big gust of wind could come through and actually implode the window that wasn't boarded up. I feel like um, you're putting again, way the more window thought into the it than they did. <laughs> Yeah, just give me yeah. the window. The window shatters because it's a storm. Yeah. The window just shatters. It causes a big piece of glass to hit Walter in the back, which gives Buddy the opportunity to trip him, which causes him to fall through the open attic floor door. Um, Buddy finally the gets the idea to run out the front door. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, he didn't go there first. He went for the gun first, which I guess uh, points out something about Buddy's character. Yeah. He's just nitty. Uh, he. <laughs> Play fiddles with the locks for a second, but then is knocked out by f- Fancy um, with a pan. Morning finally comes. <laughs> and Buddy finds himself in his truck with the drugged out guy from earlier who is now dead, which it looks like he was shot in the head. Did you guys yeah. get that? He had like a little thing yeah. on his head. Yeah, he had a blood, yeah. blood spatter or a blood hole. Wouldn't they have found like, the, I mean, I guess that's for a couple of questions, but like, wouldn't they have wasn't found the, the drugs that he was on, the IV yeah. and all that stuff? Not also, down here in the south, boy. We don't, we don't <laughs> detect like that. We go off a of hard facts. Which are stories so it wasn't the and things we that, see. How is he also in the truck that was, yeah. which I guess means it was sabotaged and then repaired? That's what I thought. Walter fixed, it, fixed, it, Walter fixed it, put whatever back that was missing and yeah. then drove him there the, and, yeah. and crashed into Stitched a ditch it. to make it look and like And then somehow accident. the police find him in the middle of nowhere, like some backcountry <laughs> road surrounded yeah. by trees. I, yeah, I was going to say, before he realizes what is going on, he his truck is surrounded by the police, bringing us full circle to him sitting in front of Detective Leghorn himself. <laughs> 
Foghorn Langhorn. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you see, boy. We found you in that truck with that dead man. Buddy asks for his lawyer and a phone call, to which Kelsey Grammer explains that in the South, you don't actually have any rights because in <laughs> wow. Grand Isle, they don't subscribe to no big city nonsense. <laughs> Buddy tells him, out here. Buddy tells him to go check out the basement, to which Foghorn asks, why are you so fascinated with that basement? As if he hadn't heard the story that he just told him. Like, uh, obviously all the things I just told you are the reason I'm fascinated with that basement. Uh, the detective who has been hanging out in the other room, uh, who is apparently actually a competent detective, um, yeah. <laughs> he hears, but or she hears, buddy mention the cloth with the Japanese lettering on it, and that's good enough for her to believe his entire story. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Well, no, in a because yeah, it, yeah, there's a reason for it. <laughs> then Kelsey Grammer gives his theory of what actually happened, and it goes a little something like this. Okay. <laughs> While Buddy was in the Navy, he developed a taste for violence. He came home, found a girl, and had a kid, but domestic life wasn't what he'd hoped for. Then he bumped into an ex-Marine who pissed him off. So Buddy boned his wife and then killed a teenager who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he knows he's right. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, what the fuck does the teenager have to do with any of that stuff? Exactly. Like, I get why he's trying to connect the dots, because he was found in the truck with a dead teenager. Mm -hmm. But just taking that on face value has nothing to do with the entire story that he just told. Like, you'd also think, wouldn't he be interviewing the, the couple? You would think, <laughs> You know, that right? this whole story that takes place mm -hmm. around. No, didn't even think to, like, go to their house and question them or anything. Mm -hmm. Just like, ah, well... I'm sure he's full of shit. I mean, this is presumably happening the next day because Buddy's still wearing the clothes that are and all bloodied mm -hmm. up. So it's like they they find him in the truck at dawn or whatever, take him to the police station, book him, take him in to interrogate him. And they've been going, you know, the last couple hours have been part of this interrogation. But he doesn't even think to send anybody out to, to question. I mean, apparently you know, their whole the police couple. force is the two of them. You know, there's, right. there's him and then there's the woman in the other room. And then I guess some cops eventually. <laughs> Uh, oh. The detective then tells Buddy's wife about his infidelity, and she leaves him on the spot. Again, like, uh, she's pretty shrill and uh, frigid, but at the same time, she makes a lot of sense. Everything that she does makes sense, and every question that she has right. and every uh, suggestion mm -hmm. that she has for Buddy, that all makes sense. Like, yeah, I could just go mm -hmm. to work at this coffee shop, and then we wouldn't be starving to death, and our baby wouldn't <laughs> die of whooping cough or whatever the hell's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other detective who's been hanging out in the other room overheard Buddy mention the cloth. She <laughs> mentions a newspaper she saw at some point uh, with a picture of a missing teenage girl, a uh, Japanese teenage girl, wearing a silk dress that had the writing on it, or had writing mm -hmm. of some sort on it, and that's good enough for her and Foghorn to just immediately switch and completely believe everything that Buddy had to say, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that's good detective work. She she got the lead from him and decides to follow up. On, I don't know about immediately disregarding suspect number one, who was literally found with a dead body. <laughs> but it was good enough to follow up on some of the things he was saying and maybe get them to go out right. to the house and question this couple. Hey, Kelsey Grammer, I saw a newspaper that had a picture of a teenage girl, and she was wearing a Japanese dress with Japanese writing on it. And here's a police report about a missing Japanese girl. <laughs> Well, I'll be. He's been telling the truth the entire time. Uh, the detectives head to Fancy and Walter's house, finally. I guess uh, Kelsey Grammer had something better to do than be in that scene. Right, he wasn't there that day. He's not, he's not there at all. Um, yeah, it's like the, it's the woman detective and some other random detective we've never seen before. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, like, two cops. Walter explains away being beaten to a pulp by saying the power went out and he tripped and fell on his face and then he cut his hand on a broken window. 
He's also gesticulating with his with his right arm, which is the same arm that got impaled with like yeah. a seven inch piece of glass that happened yeah. just that night, yeah. like through the shoulder when the window shattered and then he fell out of a, <laughs> the attic stairwell and then rolled down the stairs and landed on his same shoulder. Yeah. He, yeah. he doesn't he's even face it. Up. He's moving his arm around talking. You know, he's, that, yeah. I, that's something I noted. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you guys noticed the, the other, the other cop who speaks in that scene. Like, <laughs> I don't know what was going on with that guy, but his voice really made me laugh. This here's a search warrant. We have reason to believe that you might be performing illegal activities. Where's, I think there's some illegal activities. <laughs> That's his version of a southern accent, dude. <laughs> yeah, we'll get some local casting here. Yeah, we're gonna probably shot in Canada as well. Yeah. Like Wicker Man. Uh, the cops go straight to the basement immediately, <laughs> which now suddenly has no locks on it. Did you notice that? There was no right. locks yeah, on that yeah. door. There's, yeah. And then. Uh, I assume they is. took the locks off to make it look less suspicious, maybe. Maybe. But then they didn't clear out the actual basement, so. Yeah, so right. what was the point of any of that? I don't, like, yeah. they, like, didn't they? All right, we'll get to it in the question. <laughs> so now we finally, we finally get to see what's in the basement. We finally get to find out what this big, dark secret is that this movie's been hiding from us the whole time. Except not at all. <laughs> Fancy and Walter have been locking women in the basement, which is the size of a missile silo all of a sudden. I don't know if you noticed that. It's all concrete. I don't know. That was it's weird. All, yeah, it's all concrete. <laughs> yeah. Corridors. Metal cells. <laughs> yeah. They've been apparently, at this point, they've been holding these teenage girls for no apparent reason, which we, because they don't let us know. Mm -hmm. What the hell has actually been happening until the convenient news report at the very, very end of the movie? Yeah, Literally, literal end of the movie. And last thing that's said in the movie. Walter says he won't be a part of Fancy's bullshit anymore and decides to bail, but not before delivering another classic line. Officer, <laughs> my cat is stuck up in a tree. Will you shoot it down for me? <laughs> I want to I wanna stop you here. He says Ossifer in that line. <laughs> he doesn't say officer. I rewound it and watched it three times <laughs> he says he says ossifer my cat's stuck in a tree would you shoot it down <laughs> like, a, like he's a, still like a drunk. drunk yeah because yeah, he's drunk. Drunk. <laughs> yeah that's all that whiskey those the, the CBRs. subtitles the <laughs> subtitles do say officer but he does say he pronounces it ossifer as the classic Oss drunk Ossifer. line <laughs> <Ossifer>. <laughs> Then he knocks out the goofy talking cop and then speeds off in his Mustang. The cops all shoot at his car, but for some reason don't jump in their own cars and give chase at any point, nor do they seem to alert other police officers of this uh, madman on the loose. They don't even like get on the radio or anything. They just like, ah, well, what can you do? They just shoot at him and he gets away. Quick, shoot him before he gets out. Uh, he's gone, I guess that's the end of this. Oh well, put out that's a name that he's gone. Kelsey Grammer, justice. Kelsey Grammer says that they found a nightmare in the basement, <laughs> but he never says what they found and lets Buddy go. <laughs> Buddy doesn't even ask. He's just like, oh, well. yeah. Nightmare. Right. That's the other cool. thing. They just let him go. He don't, they don't hold him for further questions, you know, because right. now there's, he told there's the an story, active, I guess. you know, active well, other murder investigation going on at this house or whatever, or whatever they're we, investigating. We, yeah, and they but, still let this witness go. Well, yeah, <laughs> like, that's that's city stuff. That's big time city stuff that they would keep him. <laughs> but this is the side, boy. We don't, we don't cotton to that around her. <laughs> Uh, Buddy finds his wife leaving with the baby and she takes off to her mother's house. Walter is then on the lam for at least as long as it takes for Buddy's face to heal up. Uh, thanks to those idiot cops who didn't do anything to try and stop him. There's like a little weird scene with like him uh, hearing a baby toy go off, which I guess was to alert that like, you know, Walter's still out there and he could be coming for him at any point. I didn't really get what the hell the point of that scene was. Yeah. I, and he's drinking like heavily. Yeah. He drinks heavily out of a, a whiskey bottle, so it's like, oh, well, now he's becoming Walter. I guess. I don't know. I don't know oh, what that scene was about. Right. He's shit. becoming his dad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's suddenly, a cycle. Suddenly we hear a shot outside the only coffee shop in town, apparently. <laughs> And we see a freshly shaven Walter in full military regalia holding Buddy's wife at gunpoint. Quick 
couple of fact here, or couple, uh, a quick couple of quick fact. I already say that. Couple of quick fact. <laughs> Cage, I, I took this directly from something that somebody wrote on IMDb, so I, I'm literally just saying exactly what they say here. Cage was supposed to be an ex-Marine, but he's wearing a bizarre looking quasi-military uniform that doesn't belong to any branch of the armed forces, with the insignia rank of both Army Private Second and Specialist Fourth, along with a checkered tie and two Army Marksmanship medals. <laughs> so uh, most of it seems to be <laughs> army related. Yeah, because it's what's well, all green, right? And like marine dress is like the blue, right, with the flat cap yeah. and the white, the white yeah. flat cap and the blue dress, well, the blue then, dress like, uniform. The uniform he's wearing is not. It's like some, it doesn't yeah. pertain to any it's military. It's hot, like, like hey, hodgepodge. Yeah, it's like what does a military uniform look like? <laughs> I don't it. know. Just, Just go, go find a bunch of random stuff and put it on this green <laughs> uniform. <laughs> Yeah, so in my mind, he, because he was on the run, he went to some army surplus store or that's what like I was Value Village that's and just bought it and so bought whatever what random say. dress uniform he could find. Because he ran it's off like, and he didn't keep that in true, his car, huh? presumably. So, so Yeah, I kind of thought the same thing. It's like, well, this movie's insane, so he probably stopped at a thrift store and just picked up whatever yeah. he could find because he has a mission. Uh, well... Maybe we put more thought into it than they thought it or they put into it also. <laughs> I figured it was just in his car. Like he just kept, keeps a military uniform or he snuck back into the house. I don't know yeah. how he got it, but anyways. <laughs> Walter compares not dying with his platoon to Buddy not having his wife and kid around <laughs> and then <laughs> makes Buddy admit that he did nothing to save anyone on the ship after it was attacked. So he kind of like admits his own yeah. cowardice. Uh, of his mm -hmm. friend who was burning alive and he did nothing to save him, which pisses Walter off because he's like, I thought we had something <laughs> in common, even though I didn't do anything even to help anybody. I because... just ran away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he calls, he calls Buddy a wife. coward. And then, yeah, I just ran away from my wife and cops instead of facing <laughs> yeah. the repercussions of my actions. Uh, suddenly, Kelsey Grammer shows up with a bunch of cops and Walter demands that Fancy be released to which Detective Leghorn says that they put her in a mental facility. Nick Cage <laughs> delivers another gold line read uh, about the system that doesn't care about him and his fellow Marines. I, I don't know what he was going for there. Like, this is how uh, army people talk, right? Okay. This worked. Like Forrest Gump meets Nicholas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I could think. Walter charges at the cops with two guns, which he didn't have another gun. I don't know where the other gun came from, but he, he had one gun on Lisa, apparently, right. and then, then switched it over to Buddy, and then suddenly had another, which I guess he could have pulled from somewhere. But Yeah, I think he, I think he pulled it out of his pocket, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Because he does, like, he lets go of Buddy, and then he does this weird motion, and I think he's pulling it out of his pocket. Yeah. So he charges at them with two guns, and he finally gets to go out in a blaze of glory like he's always wanted. Uh, Bunny is also shot in the process, even though he's behind the car and like six <laughs> feet from Walter. He gets Which, shot in the chest or something. Another, <laughs> another police no thing that's him. actually pretty yeah. accurate, I think. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, uh, what, how did you put it? Kentucky Fried Frazier? <laughs> Kentucky Fried Crane. Kentucky Fried Crane. I'm pretty KFC. sure he's the one that shot Bunny just as a fuck you. <laughs> I don't like you, son. You don't believe in God. I don't like you, big city boys. <laughs> uh, Walter dies to the sound of Buddy's baby crying, which is like the worst possible thing you can hear at the end of your life. I mean, I couldn't think of a worse thing to, to hear as I'm dying yeah. than a baby crying. I would have put that gun in my mouth and pulled the trigger just to shut that baby oh. up. <laughs> Get this over with quicker. Bow. Uh, Buddy and his wife decide to work things out in the hospital after he's been shot. <laughs> and he at long last learns to appreciate what he has in life. Finally, thanks to a news report on a radio somewhere off screen, somewhere, I don't know if it's in the hospital or what, but a convenient radio station uh, says... 
we find out <laughs> that uh, Fancy and Walter were forcing the teenagers in the basement to have babies against their will, presumably because Fancy couldn't have any of her own. And mm-hmm. for some reason, starved those two Girl Scouts from the beginning of the movie to death. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. But those, I, those I, Girl Scouts run away. They're not, they don't come into the house. They run yeah. away. So did Walter chase them down and bring them back and starve them? Or, I don't know. But, but yeah, yeah, that I was the biggest I don't get thing. that at what all. Like that part, I, I, I was like, what the fuck? I had to rewind <laughs> and watch that again. I was like, what the uh, fuck? Why? So they found these two Girl yeah. Scouts emaciated in the basement. I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> okay all right I, let's let's get into a couple of questions that's the end of the movie the credits come up right after you find out they starved these two children to yeah. death for no reason still good the biggest to me the biggest shot in the in that scene nick cage's final scene is that uh kelsey Grammer was actually there because mm-hmm. I was convinced that he shot the whole movie in one day in the room that they had set up for the interrogation yeah, thing, yeah, and that was the end of the scenes. <laughs> so I, I, the fact that they got him to come back for a second day. day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come back Whoa. for a second day on location and film outside the coffee shop was actually pretty pretty, pretty astounding yeah. to me. <laughs> Walter, we could settle this over a beer. <laughs> I don't drink no more. <laughs> I sure as hell done drinking. We have a couple of questions before we move on hey, this movie i feel like uh there are a lot of questions so let's get into a couple of questions here um i'll kick it off with uh kind of uh, sequentially through the movie here uh, so no one heard the shot or the guy falling through the fence i know we kind of talked about yeah. this but like there's no neighbors that hear random gunshots coming from this guy's house apparently all the time because he was shooting bottles off the fence he shot yeah, a right. random person in the middle maybe of the night maybe that's the explanation like they they're used to hearing him shoot guns at all hours just cause... walt i mean it is the south I right mean, yeah yeah i, yeah, I, I chalked I mean, it up to they own a large plot of land and uh if there is anybody around this dude is a nut job who's shooting guns all the time also yeah. like like i didn't uh, used to from my experience in the south people shoot guns all the time like everywhere you yeah, go yes. there's a stop sign with like a thousand bullet holes in it and like yeah. i mean people are constantly yeah. shooting and you just you'll just be sitting there like oh somebody must be shooting off fireworks here in the middle of the yeah. night the like at, of at, at my wife's parents house they live out in like out in the woods out in rural uh you know it's not like in a city or anything and their neighbors are firing shotguns and stuff all the time you just hear it you don't even think mm-hmm. anything of it so <laughs> That's that's actually pretty believable to me. Yeah, <laughs> given yeah, how remote same, this location same. seemed to be. Uh, like a single shot first, at night, but then, he could have been shooting yeah. at a coyote or something. Yeah, yeah. Or this possum. one we uh, we kind of answered already. But how did Buddy know that Walter was ex-military? Like there was no yeah. clue whatsoever. There, <laughs> they just say that he can tell, right? Like he <laughs> knew just tell because by the way he, he carries military. himself and smokes that cigar. Just like tell this. by the way he's yeah. a broken down <laughs> drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a, he's, oh, he's got the Vietnam stash. Yeah, that's what they want Vietnam. What's that they? Uh, what, what's that they called you, Marines? If you say Jarhead, I'll kill you. <laughs> I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> What yeah. was uh, again? We also kind of answered this. What the hell was with the voodoo dolls? Like it never came up yeah. again. Was it supposed nope. to yeah. represent the victims? That's the only thing that makes sense to me is that it yeah. it represents uh, their victims in some way. Yeah, but they never rally back to that. They never double back and say, "Well, yeah, okay." So she would make a doll for each victim that they brought in, or each girl they abducted and right. forced to have a kid. These two, same thing. Bloody fence post. We kind of we kind of answered that one, but yeah. like he didn't notice it at all. It didn't get on his hand. He didn't then he wipe it on bright. his shirt. Yeah, yeah, he ain't very bright. So and wouldn't the cyanide have killed Walter if it got into his eyes? I mean, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, he would have died, it, right? It, he would have died. Yeah, it if had he was actual be, cyanide, he would have died. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, like after the twist is revealed that they're kind of like Fancy and, and Walter are kind of working together in this weird way. Like it kind of that's when I was like, OK, so it, it wasn't actually cyanide. And yeah, I guess he was testing him to see if he would kill her. But that that's one thing that bothered me, too, is what what was the point? Like if he had tried to poison her. <laughs> 
and she didn't die, like, what was the next move going to be? I think it would have right. been, you know, like, oh, you think you're a murderer, huh? And then he would have, like, killed him or they would have tortured him right. or That's something. What I think. Yeah. Give him um, an excuse and, to try and kill him for trying to kill his wife. Yeah. True. And, and then I was also kind of wondering, like, after the reveal about the women, like, were they going to then use buddy as somebody to impregnate these women as well it's another question it's yeah. like it's, it just doesn't like I, I, there's so many open, <laughs> open like there's so many unanswered <laughs> questions and like the, tw- the like twist after twist that kind of don't make any sense yeah i, I don't know <laughs> like was she really gonna yeah. leave with him like uh, right you know, so you break down that scene like she wants to go and then nick cage is uh, telling Buddy, like, ask her about the basement, go to the basement. Was she actually going to leave with him? Because she gets mad at Nick for saying that stuff. Like, you yeah. just had to keep telling him about my secrets. When, um, like, throughout, for, for some reason, I got the impression that Nick Cage actually, he wanted to die. And he wanted out mm-hmm. of this situation. And he actually did want her dead so that he could end this whole craziness because it seems... T- that it was Fancy's idea to abduct these people yeah. and hold mm-hmm. them and, and have them have sex with each other, I guess. I mean, what like so the guy that was drugged out in the room that was just some random store closet, for some reason, I guess they didn't have enough room down in the basement anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they put yeah, him in there. Yeah, um, that's another like, question I had. Why, why in there if you have this why is he in there? Yeah. basement? Were they trying to nurse him back to health so that he could then have sex with the girl, the Japanese girl they just got downstairs. And Maybe he already where, had, where he had, he had part time. of her clothes yeah. in his, in his hand. Yeah. Like he, yeah, he did have her, clock. You know. but then yeah, same things like, where are all the kids? Like they, they make, they mentioned that they, <laughs> they were force forcing him to, to have children together, have children. Right. But where are these kids? Like what where you, are all the that, babies that, that, that these teenagers were having? Yeah. Cause wouldn't they just that. adopt them and nobody would know any different? Like you yeah, just say that they're kids. What do you just say they're adopted? Yeah. you had this family that you won. I thought at a certain it's point... It's almost as if that was added to the movie after the fact. <laughs> Could be. As a oh, plot point oh. that was just thrown in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a voiceover at the very end of the movie. <laughs> Which would make sense, because, okay, did this bother you guys? So you have the two cops that go down in the basement first, right? And then it's like, okay, it's taking too long, so then the female detective goes down, and she, and then it's taking too long, and so then uh, funny talking <laughs> southern cop is about to go down before Nick Cage distracts him. Uh-huh. And then... That lady, the lady detective finds the room with the girl in it, but never passes by the other two cops and they don't, they don't show up until she opens the door and then they go up, (laughs) go back upstairs. I was like, well, where are those two? I was expecting like, like I said, it's like a missile silo down down there. Yeah, right. I guess they just. But like, she wasn't, was she calling out to him? I can't remember. No, like, no, well, she's just, just going out there silently. Why wasn't she calling she out silent. for him? I don't know. At that part, I was like, "Well, what's the point of this? Like, you got two cops down there who disappeared." So I was expecting somebody, a third party, to be down there and killing everybody. Yeah, mm. to, pro- yeah. to try that makes to like, sense. continue to protect the secret, and then she was going to uh-huh. end up killing whoever that person was, and then find all these girls that were down there, or these missing <laughs> persons that were down there. But they just once again just dead Apparently ends. Apparently not. I mean, they just it, let them go down there and find everything yeah. and spoil it yeah. and, and ruin their whole plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that leads me to my next question: Is why would they let Buddy go if they know that he'll yeah. immediately tell the cops what happened and lead them straight to that basement? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Kill why him? do they even? One of my questions was: Why do they even do all this to Buddy when now he, they, he can link? You know, his dis- if he goes missing, presumably his disappearance will be on them because he called his wife mm-hmm. and his wife knows where he is. His company mm-hmm. presumably knows where he went because he was sent mm-hmm. there specifically to do this job. It's like the Wicker Man thing all over again. Like there's so many mm-hmm. breadcrumbs that lead directly to Walt and Fran- and Fancy uh-huh. that if Buddy anything happens to Buddy, they're immediately going to become suspicious. And apparently, they don't do anything to avoid suspicion because the cops show up and they just let them wander down into <laughs> yeah. their their rape basement and don't do anything <laughs> yeah. to try and stop them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 and that's another thing. So, too. what so was their plan? That, <laughs> that storage room where the guy was being drugged, Nicholas Cage kicked that thing off, kicked that door off the hinge like he had hit it with a freaking explosive, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> and then like the cops and then, like they, that door is supposed to be right next to the basement door. The cops don't even like think, oh, this is kind of weird. Let me go in here and see what's going no. on. Like, they, no, they're just focused straight on straight going to the basement. The basement. <laughs> yeah, which makes sense because Buddy told him that's where all the craziness was going on. Yeah. And I guess true is another so reason why. Why didn't they just kill Buddy? I mean, that would have solved all of yeah. these problems. Right. Yeah, they killed Except they kid. wouldn't because they, you know, again, they would have led them to them because they would have known where Buddy so was. So why the hell did they bring Buddy suddenly. in in the first place? What the hell was exactly. the point That's of what bringing I'm him there? Yeah. <laughs> I still don't understand why they brought because him Because my other couple of question, another one of them is, uh-huh. is, is, uh, Walter says I've been like I specifically requested you to come by so he's been watching him or tracking Mm -hmm. him or like researching handymen in the area who have military histories and then he cross referenced that with their actual military history and found the Mm -hmm. one guy who had a you know might have connected with him because he had survivor's guilt over an attack or something. But why? What's it, the, it feels he like automatically and he, and he hates Buddy right from the get go. Like he doesn't mm-hmm. he doesn't have anything in common with him. He disrespects him. He doesn't like him at all. So why did he go to all this trouble? <laughs> why did Walt have all this criteria for having a handyman if he brings in Buddy who apparently meets this criteria but doesn't and it doesn't actually matter for what the story ends right. up being in the end? Why right. did he go to all this elaborate trouble to, to, to hook to hook somebody and bring him out to their house? <laughs> I mean, it's almost like they just completely forgot the what they were writing halfway through the story. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. so many like things that are set up and then not paid off. And then another yeah. thing will come and you'll be like, well, what about why did this happen? And it's kind of like, ah, move on. Story's continuing. Right. So yeah, just keep, just keep it moving. Keep it moving. Do something crazy, Nick. Do something crazy. <laughs> Officer, can you shoot my cat out of the tree? <laughs> oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> keep that in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, the whole movie just kind of boils down to what was the plan right, the yeah. whole time? Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> it does doesn't really seem like there was one. It just seems like two. Right from the beginning, people. I was wondering why they're even bothering to repair the fence the day before a hurricane I know. hits, yeah. where presumably all your shit's going to get wrecked anyway. You could at least yeah. wait <laughs> a few days to figure out what else you need to repair. I, I think so. What is the impetus to have too. this happen right now? Maybe yeah, the idea was that that. that uh, they would have him come and repair the fence and then he would somehow get killed in the storm or something like uh, they his truck would be off the side and, yeah. and maybe he drown or something like that. Maybe that's maybe that was the idea. But again, it's like they could have just killed Buddy and, and saved themselves all of the trouble of those cops coming. So yeah. then you got to ask, like, what is what is their end game? Like, what were they trying to get out of this elaborate plan? <laughs> right. Was it to have things pay off exactly as they did? They clearly didn't want to get caught. <laughs> right. But they do nothing to stop themselves from being caught. That was my biggest issue with the the final the, the finale of the movie is the cops just show up and find everything and that's it. Like that's yeah. that's that's, it. that's the yeah. that's yeah. the resolution. Is like well, yeah, Walter. Oh, I guess, like, yeah, Walter runs <laughs> off. Fancy goes to a mental <laughs> hospital. <laughs> And then uh, Walter comes back and finally gets his his wish of death. I don't know. Like I feel like if I were <laughs> if I were scoped in this, if I were the one having written, you know, writing the story, it would have been that Walter was Walter was behind this the whole time. Like he was trying to get uh, Buddy to kill his wife and then <laughs> kill him and and frame Buddy for their death. So that way he, like you said, he could have this release. Like he's, he's mm. tired of living this life of you know, right. capturing these women. And you know, he just has the cur- He doesn't have the courage to take his own life. You could honestly but, uh, just yeah. throw the whole capturing women right. shit yeah, out of it. it. Yeah. Having babies yeah, thing, all anything. of that could go away. And it could just be about these two lunatics who are having all this trouble with the two of them. Yeah. And then buddy just gets caught in the middle. That would have been a yep. much better story than oh, yeah. adding this element yeah. of, weird stuff happening yeah. in the basement. I mean, it does. It feels like that was the story. And then they added the <laughs> subplot of the basement kidnappings yeah. for no reason <laughs> right. other than they needed some other nefarious stuff to go on. Like, I, I, it, it's just the way that it's structured and the way that none of the stuff that, the, that Buddy and Fancy do seems to really... <laughs> hint at what they're doing in the basement or with these like i, I guess mm-hmm. they sort of bring it up in dialogue like oh there's other ways to have kids or whatever but like 
it still doesn't equate like kidnapping teenagers and forcing them to have sex in your basement and then having babies that you apparently don't even raise yourself right. or anything. Yeah, and, and then you starve like, two it really, children. It really, that really come just to your felt house. like it was added. They, they at the saved end. that yeah. whole chunk of the movie for like the last twenty minutes. So, right, it just like there was not enough time to like flesh out that whole idea at all. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense with anything else that's happening in this movie. Uh, my other main big one was just like, what is the message of the movie? <laughs> I know movies, I know that movies don't always have to have messages. They can be purely for entertainment value. Like, I don't think Wicker Man had a deep message other than like just watching this, no, you know, bizarre think, mystery murder w- happen. Wicker Man had a, a point of like fanaticism leads down dangerous roads okay. this movie yeah. i felt like the, the I, like, point of it there's a message of like you know sexual frustration can lead to bad things there's a there's a theme of sexual frustration with all three of the main characters mm-hmm. but it's also wrapped up in like not appreciating what you have yeah. but also like the system and the government doesn't care about that, veterans uh-huh. <laughs> and also like uh i, I don't know what else Small town morals are important, but also bad because the detective is our small town, you know, guy. And there was just so much going on. I don't know what the movie wanted me to take away from it. I I felt like the point was like, be thankful for the things that you have. Don't dwell on the past and like try and make the best of what you have in the moment. I think that was kind of the point, but... It's that's, hard to if that's say. the point of it. Then there's no reason to have the kidnapped teenagers yeah, in the basement right. of the house. I mean, she, well, she, act. Like, she wanted to be able to have kids, and this was her sick, weird way of being able to have kids because she didn't appreciate what she had, and neither did Walt. Walt didn't appreciate what he had, and if they would have just, if everybody in this movie would have just appreciated each other and had sex, most of the story wouldn't have happened. <laughs> 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 I just had an overall feeling with this movie of like, why? <laughs> like, yeah. Why is anything happening? What is the point? Why am I supposed to? What am I supposed to be taking away? Yeah, right. Why is it being presented to me in this manner? <laughs> I feel like that's why it got the rating that it did. Was just everybody else had yeah. that same like, okay, well, what the hell was the point of all of that? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get it. Yeah. It's time for the trackers. Uh, all right, so for our curse counter, uh, we have three hells. I waffle back and forth on whether I want to track hell the location or just say hell like what the hell. So <laughs> I think I just lumped it all into one and we'll just count it from here on okay. out. So three hells, seven uses of shit, <laughs> one ass, eight fucks, which is uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, and I don't know if you want to count this as a curse, but one use of cock. Cock, yeah. <laughs> Did, yeah I, you know, was like, this you actually know. rated? Because I didn't see that anywhere. Um, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I assumed R rated. I assumed, but like I, yeah. I didn't see it on the I think IMDb to get a physical page. Release, it's not on it the physical release. Oh. Doesn't show well, a rating anywhere. So I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming an R. Yeah, yeah, I would figure R because there's there's in. some nudity, there's swearing, there's violence, there's adult subject matter. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's got to be R. What was the grand total? Uh, grand total for Grand Isle was twenty. Twenty. So the total total between the two movies right now, we're sitting at thirty four curses. It's pretty light so far. It's going to get a <laughs> whole light. lot worse yeah. over the course of. Yeah. Uh, our next movie. There actually, there was only there was twenty in Grand Isle and fourteen in Wicker Man, so there's only six more curses in Grand Isle, but those were mostly fucks. Like <laughs> the, there were there was one fuck in the theatrical P thirteen Wicker Man, um, mm-hmm. and there were eight in in Grand Isle. So, what was uh, nice. what was your kill count on this? I mean, this is kind of so, subjective here. Yeah, I was I was just gonna go one, just one kill, one confirmed kill, because we don't really know uh they leave everything else kind of ambiguous i mean we we could count the two girls but i kind of felt like that was tacked on at the end and it didn't really have anything to do with the main story and that could be fancy's doing right it could be fancy since she was the one obsessed with the children so for nick i went with one because i'm i would assume that he's the one that shot that guy in the head Mm. because he shot him in Mm -hmm. the back um so one kill this movie which uh brings us up to two because i still count the uh pilot from <laughs> wicker man as being uh, nick cage's hands yeah uh and then uh obviously you know our hero goes out in a in a blaze of glory so 
uh, one <laughs> one death, one Nicolas Cage death in this, bringing us to a total of two two deaths, two, two movies, deaths, two deaths. So. Uh, he's had a rough go these past two movies. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to end in the next one either. So, <laughs> spoilers. He's, uh, um, he's a, you know, he just has a hard. His characters have hard <laughs> lives. <laughs> so, what did you think? Let's rank this film on the Kjometer. So, the big question. We'll start with Vince. Where yeah. does Grand Isle rate on your Kjometer? <sighs> Like I said, this is one of this has become one of my my new favorite Nick Cage movies. Uh, <laughs> it was just so absurd, you know. Put aside all the issues that we had with it, like it was so absurd, but he was so captivating. Yeah, I, I loved it when he was on screen. I loved when uh, what's her name, Katie, was on on screen. Katie Strickland. Uh, yeah, yeah, Katie Strickland. Uh, I think she actually stole the movie personally. Uh, so I got to give it a five. You know, it's it's uh, it's not a great great movie by any means, but I, I thought between <laughs> between how the movie was shot because I think visually they did an amazing job shooting it. The color palettes and everything were were very very good for yeah. a low budget movie like it was. Um, the acting bet- with with Katie uh, and then uh, just <laughs> Nicolas Cage and his interpretation of this character just <laughs> crazy, but not over the top. <laughs> But he did give you those cagey he moments had those moments that were just of, yeah. perfect, but they were dialed back. It was like a great <laughs> blend, a great, great, great blend. So, yeah, I, I, I'm going to give it a five out of ten. OK, uh, Nigel, <laughs> where does this rate? Where does Grand Isle rate so, on your cageometer? It was a little it was a little tough for me because it's it's I almost wanted to call it a good movie, <laughs> like a six out of ten. So I put it right on the uh, the cusp of being not a waste of time uh-huh. <laughs> to watch it <laughs> and because I love Nicolas Cage's performance. I love Katie Strickland's performance. Buddy's performance was meh, it wasn't that great, but you know the two there. other main leads, yeah, the there. two main leads were captivating enough to enjoy their scenes in the movie. Um, it was shot well. The cinematography we talked about was great. Uh, there was just like if I wasn't watching this movie for this purpose of doing this podcast, I would not have finished watching the movie. And I cannot call a movie good if that's the case. Like for the first hour of the movie, I was like, this is so it's like it, there's so many cliches in it. There's so many like we've, we've heard this type of a story before, you know, yeah. it's what are they where are they? Why are they doing this? Why are they wasting our time with telling us this story that doesn't need to be told until the third act twist where it just goes off the rails <laughs> and it was enough to pull me in and actually want to finish it. Um, but again, <laughs> that was because I was watching it. I had to watch it. I would not have finished this movie uh, if it wasn't for that. Um, and also there was just so there's so much bloat in this film. Yeah. Um, and so much like the characters are so I, I want to say overwritten. There's so many facets and backstory about these characters that doesn't matter at mm-hmm. all. But there yeah. was they're they're complicated, they're complex, but in the end of the day, it doesn't impact what's going on in the plot and the story and some of it actually runs counter to how the story actually ends up <laughs> that it muddies the whole <laughs> message and I, yeah. uh, I did want to talk a little bit about like why these characters have ridiculously complicated backstories like it really did feel like a student like had an assignment to write complex characters yeah. and then they got stuck into a plot that has nothing to do with those characters <laughs> it doesn't you know it doesn't doesn't have any reason for those characters to be written so I guess it's a lesson in if you got to write complex characters make sure they're in a, in a plot that, that awards that or, or has a reason for the, the viewer being invested in those characters. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that um, was the idea was like, so, I'm going to write the characters' backstories first, and then I'm just going to throw right, them into a fine. room and make them all fucking <laughs> interact with each other. <laughs> right. And I mean, I get that's a good exercise, and I think uh, any writer should do that. They should have, even if it's not, even if the whole character's backstory is not presented the the writer should know what it is this was the opposite where it's like the whole character's backstory is presented <laughs> it was given to the viewer but it doesn't have any place in the story so there's no point in doing it yeah. um so I, I gave it a five out of ten as well so it's five. still not in the awful you know it's right in the middle it's it's right on the cusp of being something good and enjoyable it has yeah. enjoyable parts but yeah. the whole of it is worse than the, the sum of its parts <laughs> yeah, yeah tighten, up, <laughs> tighten up the story and i think this would have definitely been a, mm-hmm. a six or a seven for me but yeah yeah uh you guys are making me feel like i went kind of harsh on this one um 
<laughs> I I kind of put the the Wicker Man as kind of a bar of like if if the Wicker Man is a four, I can't I can't actually make Grand Isle a better movie than the Wicker Man because the Wicker Man made sense. I mean, <laughs> it had a, a beginning, middle, and end, and it actually kind of had a flow and made somewhat sense. It was corny and a lot of goofy shit happened, but like. Mm-hmm. Um, this movie was, you know, like you guys said, the strong points were the way it was shot. I mean, it's a gorgeous movie from start to finish. I mean, it's just beautifully shot all the way through. Um, mm-hmm. The acting, uh, you know, I felt like <clears throat> Kelsey Grammer was a little phoned in. And it was probably this was probably just a paycheck for him. Um, mm-hmm. And then Buddy was kind of like he was there. Uh, I didn't feel like his 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 performance detracted in any way, but I don't think it really added a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. Nick Cage was Nick Cage. And, it, you know, the, this is the, the whole reason we're doing this show is because Nick Cage and everything he does brings something to it that you're not expecting. And I think that's a, really the beauty of him as an actor and why we love him so much is that I, I just, you know, the uh, oh here he goes, Mister Negotiator! All of a sudden, like <laughs> that was not written like that. There's no way yeah. that yeah. okay, go completely outrageously over the top, crazy for a second, and <laughs> it's just uh, like spitting and just just, just take a big yeah. suck off the cigar. Um, the way he delivered the uh, sucked. Uh, your cock, you know, like that whole thing. <laughs> Amazing. All, all, he, he was incredible, of course. Katie Strickland, yeah. I actually, the first time, I didn't really like her performance very much. I kind of felt like it was a little over the top and it was a little like, I don't know, I didn't really like it. But then the second time I watched it, I actually kind of saw the nuances of her performance and I thought that she was actually, like you said, she was kind of stealing the show. She was sort of the, mm-hmm. the big bright spot in this movie. Um, but I just I can't get over the story. The story is the worst part of this whole movie, and is just all over the place. Like not a lot, so many loose ends, so many plot holes, so many things that don't pay off, yeah. so many things that are in the movie for God knows what reason, and the mm-hmm. whole twist at the end was just it didn't make any sense. It's just. And like you said, it just felt like they just added it in post. Like okay, we're gonna have this story yeah. that. We didn't actually finish because, <laughs> like, they didn't really finish what the hell was going on. It's just, <laughs> yeah, okay, right. so uh, Fancy's in a mental institution. Nick Cage, suddenly, like, his whole motivation in life is to rail against the government and uh, the way that they were treated. Right. And <laughs> It really felt like it was just a half-assed, like, Rambo message or first blood message at the mm-hmm. end where it's like, yeah. we didn't treat f- f- uh, Vietnam vets the way they should have been treated. Uh, and this is what happens when you when you don't when you don't do that. And then and when you as a person don't care about what you have in life, this is what happens. Yeah, and it was just like it, the movie didn't feel like it earned that type of a, of a message at the end. Yeah. No, he w- they were holding people captive. Like you're not a good guy <laughs> here. <laughs> why is the why is he the voice of moral authority to, right. to, for our young for our young protagonists to take away the, the right lessons from? Yeah, him? right. Like you're you're not a good guy. You're ti- like you can't use your time in Nam because you didn't have any. You you didn't even, <laughs> like what did, what did he say? Like he got injured like right away when they got yeah. deployed. So he never yeah. saw any action. It was whatsoever. like a training exercise. He got right. shot grenade. by a friendly right. fire, like a grenade, yeah. a grenade went off and shrapnel. That's it. So uh. it's, it's it's not like you can really sit there and say that like your time in the military gave you this perspective because it wasn't. You didn't have it. Now I understand the survivor guilt piece of it, but still doesn't really <laughs> justify his trying to be the moral. <laughs> of the story yeah especially mm-hmm. given the awful things he has done since his time mm-hmm. uh, right. coming back from vietnam all that being said it's a really fun movie <laughs> nick cage yeah. is nick cage i saw some review where somebody said like if you're a fan of nicholas cage and his acting antics you'll love this movie it's not the best movie but it's like if you need a movie and you got nothing else to watch Grand Isle is a pretty good watch. Mm-hmm. So I can't give it a better rating than The Wicker Man. So I gave it a three. So two fives and a three. 
that gives us a little over a four for this one, which is actually a better rating than The Wicker Man, which is actually really <laughs> surprising. I, I will say like this movie surprised me in a lot of different ways because I did not expect it to be a fun movie. I thought it was going to be yeah. a really shitty movie because it was a zero yeah. percent um, for one. And I knew nothing about it. I heard nothing about it. Even the trailer doesn't really tell you what the hell is going on. Um, yeah. So ultimately, it ended up being a really fun movie. So I, I still yeah. would recommend it to other people. I, I think it was a it was a fun watch. It was. I didn't watch the trailers. Yeah. Didn't read anything. I wanted to go in a hundred percent blind. <laughs> and I. Yeah. I mean, from the from the very beginning, I knew this was going to be a crazy ride and it did not disappoint it was just it was fun it was a lot of fun and i'm like like i felt like in wicker man he kind of mailed in his performance a lot of the time was for like, sure we talked about it was like very wooden kind of stale yeah this i yeah. felt like he was like he was trying to be this person in some yep. you know in whatever bizarre way that he does when he's acting and sometimes it felt really good like it felt like he was really nailing the idea that yeah. he had then other times it was <laughs> typical nick cage where it was just it every, was absurd. every single nick cage performance is unique i mean every time yes. he goes out <laughs> the dude swings for the fences and sometimes you know that's that's the whole debate with nick cage it's like some of the movies really fall flat and some of the movies are mm -hmm. like awesome worthy just brilliant performances mm -hmm. so this one is somewhere in between i feel like you know i, I thought he was great it's, he's never going to win an oscar for this but i thought it was a great no great role no. kelsey grammar was just a, a name that they put he was on there. the box he was yeah. not he did not add or detract anything from that movie i was i was disappointed i thought he'd have more uh, yeah same more of a yeah more i wasn't do. expecting a lot <laughs> he was in it more than i was so, expecting i actually thought it was going to be yeah. like the first scene he the guy would be telling him the story and that was going to be the end of it and then maybe he'd pop back yep. in at the end and be like wow that's a lot yeah. of a lot of crazy things <laughs> that happened there <laughs> right <laughs> Here it is, the moment you've all been waiting for. These are the cagiest moments of the film. What you think? Oh, there he is, Mr. Negotiator all of a sudden. Of course it's gonna cost me. Right, if, if I left my equipment in my truck here, can I use your car go home? I, I gotta <coughs> check on my family. Well, you think I'll let you pull some backdoor trade and leave me with a beat up truck while you steal my Mach 1 Mustang? <laughs> Cyanide. You just cover her mouth with it and she'll be gone in minutes. You just, huh, 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 huh. Okay, pull it on the rack. Pour it on the rack! Shoot me. Slay me. I'm ready. Also, for my cat is stuck up in the tree, would you shoot him down for me? What? I what? said my cat is stuck up in a tree. Would you shoot him down for me? <laughs> this here is a sacrifice against a system that doesn't give a shit about me or my fellow Marines. Oh, hell, we could talk this out over a beer. <laughs> That's it for this episode of One Cage at a Time. Be sure to drop us an email at onecagepodcast at gmail.com to let us know if we missed anything or hit us up with any suggestions to improve the show, comments, compliments, or simply to gush about the legend that is Nicolas Cage. In our next episode, we'll be enjoying the insane splendor that is Deadfall, which features possibly the single most insane Nick Cage performance ever caught on film, which is saying a lot. Yeah. Uh, it is the story of a New York con artist who heads out to California to find the look-alike brother of his also con artist father and features an all-star cast of Hollywood heavy hitters such as Michael Biehn of Terminator and Tombstone fame, Peter Fonda, James Coburn, Talia Shire, Charlie Sheen for about three minutes, and of course, Nicolas Cage. As we said earlier, it also holds a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> which we did entirely by accident, I, I, I assure you. Make sure to check it out wherever fine films are sold or on your streaming service of choice. Until then, we'll say goodbye the way we do each and every episode with our Nicolas Cage quote of the film. Now, an example, uh, when was the last time you had your uh, cock? Um, sucked. 
Thanks for listening to One Cage at a Time. Visit us online at onecageatatime.com or follow us on the social media platform of your choice for more Nicolas Cage goodness. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you really like the show, become a member of our Patreon where you can download unedited and ad-free episodes as well as listen to our follow-up show, Back Into the Cage, where we re-examine each movie to discuss what we missed the first time around, answer listener questions, and wax poetic about the man, the myth, the legend that is Nicolas Cage. Hey there. I'm here by the fence. Look, somebody called and requested I come, uh, buddy. <laughs>